This is a Volcker-esque type of Fed where they are clearly focused on getting inflation down. Core inflation, food, energy, that whole thing is no longer transitory. It's very sticky and they're worried. And there has been some signs that the economy is losing a little momentum. We actually think there's a 50-50 chance of a recession in the next 12 months. If there's a recession, it's not going to be a massive recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down about a quarter of 1% on the S&P. TK, big day ahead for Chairman Powell. President Lagarde and Governor Bailey. Well, they're all going to get together to talk about the dreaded R word without mentioning it, recession. We heard it there in the opening. Everybody's got an opinion uh, right now. Certainly in the last 24 hours, John, it shifted a little bit uh, gloomier as well. I would go to Michael Tran of RBC Capital Markets, and maybe they ought to read his research note, which is you can't predict any of this. He says oil price it can be swift, violent, and unforgiving. John, can the economic data that these central bankers face be swift, violent, and unforgiving? Let's go to the data. Here's my word, Tom. <clears throat> Dreadful. Richmond Fed manufacturing. Dreadful. Yes. Dallas Fed manufacturing. No question about it. Dreadful. Consumer confidence. Not great. That's been the last 24, 48 hours. Yeah, Zero Hedge had a nice chart on that last night in their summary where they looked at soft data, hard data, and the hard data is catching up fast uh, with the soft data. And, you know, you see it in the market. You see the way it's rolled over now. Futures are negative nine. But, John, um, I, I look all in all at this, and the number one thing I see is a resilient oil price to Michael Trans' comments. I'm still running on Central European time, Tom, so I was up early this morning I looking at understand. the inflation data yeah, you know. coming through. And I have to say, Bram, a whipsawed by it. We've been getting these regional prints for German inflation. They were softening. And then Spanish inflation came out absolutely surging. Yeah, 10 percent, uh, unprecedented in 37 years of history and unexpectedly high, really pressuring the ECB to do something, even at a time where they're trying to calibrate how much of a fallout they'll be on the peripheral regions. How much of a potential credibility issue is there? And this is something that Mohamed Alarian uh, raised in a Financial Times article about the whipsaw effect of them missing the boat and then perhaps going too far, too fast in the opposite direction and not getting ahead of markets. And then start in and then yes, started exactly. again. I read the Mohammed piece in the FT this morning. Fantastic piece. And Lisa, that's the risk, isn't it? They get scared about what happens with growth, then they let inflation rip again, then they have to go again. That's the risk, the fear that Mohammed has going into the end of 22 and into 2023. And this is the reason why Lorna Mester came out this morning and said that she's actually quite concerned. They're just at the beginning of raising rates and that she <clears> sees <throat> rates uh, well into the 4%, the overnight benchmark rates at 4% next year. Now, does that lower long-term rates or does it send, send them higher because it indicates some sort of base rate that is higher than otherwise what we'd be seeing. Has the market got in front of this? Tom, JP Morgan out this morning cutting price targets on Snap, Google, Meta, yeah. Amazon, take <clears throat> your pick. Then they go on to say this. While our projections come down, we believe buy side expectations and many equity prices already reflect a softer macro environment. So telling us what they think we know well, already, perhaps, Tom. Again, it's a parlor game now. And as Alicia Levine of BNY Mellon said yesterday, her outside outlier case is a multiple, John, from another time and place, 12 times earnings. Uh, that's from my youth. I had less gray hair then. And that, that, uh, Alicia Levine had no gray hair then. It was that, you know, long ago. You want ago. to keep digging it, Tom? No, it's... Just it's, it's let you go a little bit. Uh, the multiples here... Is that what you're doing? The, the, the multiples here... <laughs> Uh, are adjusting rapidly, and I agree the yeah. street is out front of the sell side on earnings adjustment. A shout out to Alicia yesterday who said she'd be <clears throat> buying the weakness in the energy names. Energy yesterday on the S&P. That I, was the John, one bright spot, Tom. Ripped. Th this is the story this week. I'm looking at 118 Brent, 112 West Texas Center uh, Media, and you've got the economic data tomorrow behind it. Tomorrow's our busy economic day. I'm looking forward to that and the ISM data from Friday too, and Eurozone CPI as well. Equity futures right now down about two-tenths of 1%. No real drama here this morning. Good morning to you. On the Nasdaq 100, down about a third of 1%. Yields just a little bit higher, 317.54. Not much of a move there. And Lisa, Tom talking about crude, 112 <coughs> handle on WCI, up around about 
about a third of 1% this morning. And this follows on this concern about the physical market really being incredibly tight, even if you start seeing some softness in the futures market. It's still early before the drama starts. And as we know throughout the day, that is when the market's drama usually does transpire. Today, what we're watching is officials heading to NATO uh, in Madrid, at the summit that they're having there, including President Joe Biden of the United States, Jens Stoltenberg of NATO. He's going to be giving a series of press conferences. How much do they talk about Finland and Sweden joining? How much do they talk about building up troops on the eastern front of Europe in order to counter the Russia threat? At 9 a.m., this is the big event. The European Central Bank Sintra panel in Portugal, including ECB President Christine Lagarde, Fed Chair Jay Powell, Bank of England Governor uh, Bailey, as well as Bank of International Settlements Head Augustin Karstens, Bloomberg's own Francine Lacqua will be moderating this. How much do they try to get out ahead of markets once again? They are going behind markets, to Mohamed el point. How much do they try to get ahead by giving a sense that we have a plan, we're going to stick to it, and we even know what's going to happen in a time of uncertainty where they've already allowed, in Mohamed el words, inflation to get to a very <laughs> uncomfortably high level. And at 10.30 a.m., this, to me, is going to be very interesting. We get the EIA crude oil inventory report. Yesterday, we got some gasoline uh, inventory reports showing a depletion of them. They were coming in softer than people had expected. This is bad. It indicates an ongoing tightness, even though you did see that $5 a gallon threshold that has come off. We do see diesel uh, still near record highs. How much, John, do we see people actually curtailing action? Some signs of that yesterday in the conference board survey, but not anecdotally from anyone who I've talked to. Bremo, thank you. Lisa, with what you need to look for through the next 24 hours or so. Joining us now is Jens Nordvig, founder and CEO of Exante Data. Jens, let's start here. President Lagarde, Chairman Powell, Governor Bailey. What's your number one question going into that a little bit later this morning? I would say what matters more, growth or inflation, right? Uh, we had a totally different cycle than we've seen for the last 40 years, <laughs> right? That even if we have recession fears, uh, the, the central banks are in a very, very tricky spot, right? Because inflation is way above target and they can't really focus on growth as much as they've done in the past. And I think if you look at what's going on in the market, right, uh, we, we've clearly had the recession focus over the last couple of weeks, right? And nevertheless, uh, bond, bond, bond yields are, are close to the highs, right? It, it used to be the case, the lesson for the last four years was as soon as there was any weakening in growth, you just had to close your eyes and buy bonds. And this cycle is totally different, right, because it is an inflation cycle as opposed to just a growth cycle. I look, Jens, at the path of inflation, and this will be my question today to these uh, bankers, and it's a really esteemed panel to say uh, the least, folks, so I really pay attention to that. Jens, to me, inflation is bipart in that there's an easy path down, core comes down, and then it gets way, way more difficult. Where do you perceive the level of inflation where it really becomes heavy lifting for these central bankers? Yes, so I, th I think we probably have uh, a period where goods prices and commodity prices are going to come down over the next year. And that uh, really has not much to do with central bank policy, right? And then the question is, if the wages and the services prices stay elevated so that a drop in, in those other prices don't really get the overall inflation numbers down that much, then the central banks are gonna do the heavy, heavy lifting and really get tight. Don't forget, we're talking about the Fed having overdone it. How many months have they actually been hiking? A, a couple of months. We're, we're a couple of months in here, right? And, uh, and, and that's the discussion already, right? So the real tricky bit would be if they have to go to three and then considering going to five. Well, that's when then the pain on the economy will be, will be severe, right? Right now, we're really discussing about getting to neutral-ish a little bit above, but not really tight. It's not a Volta cycle yet, right? Uh, but that will come into play if the wages keep going, if the services prices keep going even beyond the point where this well, uh, supply issues has been fixed. Yeah, it's just real quickly here, to your point, Loretta Mester this morning in uh, Sintra said the Fed is just at the beginning of raising rates and sees rates going to 3.5% by the end of this year and a little above 4% next year. Has the market adequately priced that in? No. So, uh, so we, we, at the moment, 
especially yeah, last week, we got to an extreme point where the market was actually pricing significant cuts in 2023, right? So it essentially priced that we're going to have a nine month tightening cycle, and then we're going to start cutting, right? So uh, obviously the hikes are, are, are priced bigger than is normal for a cycle, right? Because we're talking about 50 and 75 basis point steps, but nevertheless, we were pricing a hiking cycle that was going to be essentially a year, and then the cuts were going to start. That I think is, is what's very questionable. Um, I think we're going to have a situation where the services prices are going to be sticky and it's going to be very, very hard for the Fed to, to switch to, to cutting mode. It might be the case that we're not going to be talking about 75 basis points forever. Maybe we're going to go to a more slow pace of, of, of tightening. Maybe we're going to plateau at a high level of rates. But this notion that the Fed is going to uh, flip from super hawkish to getting ready to cut within a year, that I think is, is too early. And I think we're going to push that out, and, and, and that's not priced yet. Jens Olsen, to get your view on things, as always, a bit of a reality check from you and Exante Data. Jens Nordvik there. At least I think for many people, the old playbook is still in their hands, and it hasn't really changed for them. There is this belief that every single cycle, the peak in the Fed funds rate is lower. In the next cycle, it's lower. In the next cycle, it's lower. There's some pushback against that now. And if you look at the previous rate hiking cycle, Jens is right, we've only just got started. But what we're about to see in about six months is as much as what we saw in three years of the tightening cycle in the previous decade. It's a big, big change. It's a big change in the face of a big change in inflation. And this is the underscoring point that the Fed has gotten it wrong. They thought that this would be transitory. That was wrong. They kept with accommodation, even as there were signs that they were wrong. That was a problem. All of a sudden, how do they get ahead of markets that are doing the heavy lifting for them? And if they do not follow through on this and continue to try to squelch inflation, is there a concern about 1970s, 1980s, as Mohammed al outlined? I've got an in with the moderator at about 9 a.m. Eastern. Bram, I hope you've got yeah. any questions you'd like to send. All right. I'll sounds, send you a list. sounds like Bramo's fired up, TK. I am I fired up. For this is. panel I later. Think she is. I'm, I'm excited. You've I got, think this will be interesting. You've got some firm questions. Maybe some Bramo drama. Some Bramo drama. I like that. <laughs> Just on the put panel. a little, little Bramo cam in the corner of the panel. <laughs> Eastern time. That would make it more entertaining, I have to say. Futures down a tenth on the SP from New York this morning. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says the central bank is just at the beginning of raising interest rates to control inflation. Mester told CNBC she wants to see the benchmark lending rate reach 3 to 3.5 percent this year and a little above 4 percent in 2023, even if that tips the economy into a recession. But she doesn't see that happening. The price of basic goods in British stores is rising at the fastest pace in almost 14 years. That's forcing poorer families to take drastic action to make ends meet. The British Retail Consortium said shops are having to pass on some of the burden of soaring raw material costs. Fresh food leads the surge with prices up 6% in the first half of the year. Finland and Sweden have taken a major step on the way to NATO membership. Turkey dropped its opposition, all but ensuring the military alliance's expansion on Russia's doorstep. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says the move sends a message to Vladimir Putin that NATO's door is open. A former White House aide portrayed a violent and out of control Donald Trump in his presidency's final weeks. Cassidy Hutchinson gave the most gripping testimony yet in a House committee's hearings on the Capitol riot, but doubt has been cast on a key element of her second-hand account. Hutchinson says she was told the president tried to grab the steering wheel of his limousine after the Secret Service refused to drive him to the Capitol on January the 6th. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular is back in Boston. And Bloomberg will make sure you don't miss a second of the fireworks, music, and special appearances by superstar Shaka Khan, Grammy and Tony winner Heather Headley, and the voice winner Javier Colon. Plus Middlesex Fife and Drum and the Tanglewood Festival Chorus. It all starts July 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
In light of the progress we have made together, Turkey has agreed to support Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Now President Putin is getting more NATO on his borders. So what he gets is the opposite of what he actually demanded, and that was to NATO to close its doors. Ian Stoltenberg there, the NATO Secretary General from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures are down by about two tenths of one percent. No big moves here. Muted price action on the Nasdaq. We're down about a third of one percent. Yields come in almost the basis point to 316.41 and crude at 112.23. Positive four tenths of one percent. Got to go back to that announcement from the President of the United States, Tom. Just a range of initiatives announcing a boost in a military presence across Europe. A big announcement, I think, in the last 24 hours, TK, for many yeah, people. I, big, I think, barely describes it. Thank you to James Trevitas for joining us yesterday, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, a number of, of years ago. John, on the tape, I take issue. I think the tape is showing us a lot. It's nudging, particularly off tomorrow's economic data, but using yen as a proxy, I'm so sorry. We have a weaker yen in the last 24 hours. A couple of stops to get through this week, Tom. Yeah. The big one, I think, Chairman Powell, a little bit later <clears> this morning, alongside Francine and of course, President of the Garden, Governor Bailey. Then on to the data on yeah. Friday, the ISM manufacturing together with Eurozone CPI. That's going to take, set the tone into a long weekend here the, stateside. The Norwegian Stoltenberg there with just extraordinary comments in Madrid coming off a night. We had to put them in separate clubs in Madrid. One, I don't know which one. One of them went to Joya Slava and the other went to Knox Club Madrid. But it was a good time had by all. Maria Tadeo joins us and Anne-Marie Horton dutifully separated uh, in Madrid. Maria, I have to go to you. In my study of European history, going back to Western Civ freshman year a long time ago, we'd never seen a moment like this. How does the Tsar of Russia adapt to Sweden and Finland in NATO. Uh, Tom, it's, it's going to take me a minute to actually focus because I cannot believe you know where Joyislava is. This is oh, incredible. Oh, what are those former words, lives of Tom Keane? You clearly King. did. You, you did your research, and it's very good, actually. That's, that's real insider uh, information. But going back to this uh, summit, of course, uh, we're being told repeatedly, really behind the scenes, this is going to be historic. It really is a moment of transformation. We're going to see a lot of the language that really here looks a lot like the Cold War again, the big blocks uh, that, of course, come in confrontation. The NATO now expected uh, to say Russia is a significant direct threat to uh, NATO and Europe. We're going to see more boots on the ground in Eastern Europe. Again, China is going to be a big discussion, but also by the end of the summit, and it goes back to the point the Secretary General was making, we're going to go from 30 members of NATO to 32, two countries, Finland and Sweden, that essentially are undoing in real time years of neutral policy when it comes to Russia. I... Now they perceive a risk. And if there's a takeaway from the war in Ukraine, Tom, is that if you don't belong to NATO, you're by yourself and it's very lonely out there. Maria, I'm going to go to my book of the year, Angela Sten. Putin's world. I mean, the establishment of the military in Russia has to be livid over this, aren't they? Well, completely, Tom. And uh, to some extent, we see that the fight on the ground in Ukraine continues. It is not going well. And remember, when you look at the start of the invasion, the goal was very clear. The Russians say, we want a new government in Kyiv. We want to denazify uh, Ukraine and we want to take away the weapons. We see that President Zelensky is put. By the way, he is expected to participate uh, in a meeting today with the rest of our NATO leaders. And the country is armed by a lot of allies that are sitting out in that meeting too. And on top of that, now you factor the huge border that Russia and Finland share, which is now going to be NATO compatible and, of course, a member of the NATO alliance. So for a Russian military right now, the situation looks very complicated. So how much, uh, and Anne-Marie, I'd love you to weigh in on this, is there a discussion about how much to build up troops on the eastern border as there is this coalescing around a similar threat once I guess, alliance or at least uh, a partner. I'm wondering, given the fact that the U.S. now has 10,000 troops in Poland, a whole host of others in the other states, and Germany is coming in as well, how much more is there to go here? 
Well, the president just announced a, a slew of endeavors that is going to bolster that eastern flank, including a headquarters in Poland and a continuing rotation of brigade in Romania. I think David Ignatius, a columnist at the Washington Post, who's actually in Madrid, he was on a panel last night, talked about the fact that the heart and the center of NATO is now shifting, shifting east, obviously, and also shifting north. And to go back to Tom's point about President Putin and how worried the army is, I would say that Baltic Sea Fleet that Russia has is incredibly nervous now with Finland and Sweden joining this alliance. Tom, serious issues, but I'm so distracted now. VIP tables start from 100 euros and include a bottle of alcohol, Tom, mixed drinks, an entry for a maximum of five people. <laughs> well, you know, I it's five. open open 365 yeah. days Maria's a year. TK. There for Friday. Yeah, Three, you know, you you, you, you dial one eight hundred Red Oak Keeper of the MX, and I mean, people you know, can stretch it, to a VIP research. table. <laughs> Five. Have you booked a table on Friday, guys? Is that what you've done, Anne-Marie? Mm. Maria has, and it she's the host, and with 10% Spanish was, inflation was, coming out this morning. She's paying. She's paying. <laughs> OK. Maria Tadeo, thank you. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern in Madrid. <laughs> Maria looks very annoyed <laughs> she that she's so set bad. to pay. <laughs> TK, as Lisa counted accurately, that's two plus three, five. Nice. Quick maths this morning. <laughs> thank you. Let me thank say you. A, a, well done, Bramo. a major try. shout out to Madonna. Madrid is very in, John, right now. It is, is it an really? in place to go. And as I spoke to the prime minister of Spain, I believe it was a Davos. I frankly can't remember. But the bottom line is maybe the best museum in the world in the Prado. You brought up Joya Slava with the Spanish leader. With a, yes, with the Spanish okay. leader, I did. You let you me know. know how that went. Okay. It was another life. This is my fault for taking us off the rails. The, Sp the Spaniard John the is from well. the, John, the Spaniard okay. is from the sink in Boulder, Colorado, over to Joya Slava in Madrid. Okay. How do we get to Boulder, Colorado? Uh, anyway, futures are negative. Or through too late. Down two tenths of one percent. <laughs> and then that's that one hundred. The down a third of one percent. Me or Tom? <laughs> Yes. No, get Both of us. No, no, no. I think, you know, you just got back. Yields down about a basis point in a 10-year, 316.41. Francine's going to have a good time a little bit later, 9 Eastern time, alongside President Lagarde, That's Chairman Powell and Governor Bailey. I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. Someone messaged me this morning, and I'm not sure where this came from, but they called them the transitory trio. I thought that was brilliant. I, I, the that transitory is trio. That's really good. On John, the panel I, a little bit later. I've been working on a chart here, which may be my chart of the year, which is the inflation-adjusted real wage in America. And it really shows the challenge that Chairman Powell had with the collapse of the economy at the beginning of the pandemic. Again, I'm going to say this, John. You're going to cut him some slack. Speak. I'm going to cut him some slack. <clears throat> Well, I'll just say this: the transitory will go down as one of the, you know, most painful. I, I look calls. forward to the book, Tom, about you cutting them some slack. No, the book's called Joyous Love. Is that right? Data dependency. <laughs> Futures down. And this is Bloomberg. from New York City this morning. Good morning on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance and here is your price action. Just a little bit softer on the S&P, down two tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100, down around about a third of 1%. Max Kettner over at HSBC is bearish and it becomes even more bearish as the market bounces off the lows of mid-June. He is expecting an impending, sharp growth slowdown. For that reason, underweight stocks, underweight high yield and overweight sovereigns. Let's talk about that. Treasuries, twos, tens and thirties. Your 10-year yield over the last couple of days just coming in a little bit. In again today by about a basis point or so to 316.41 after having a sniff of 325 yeah. again in the last 24 hours. The data, Tom, not great. We talked about the Dallas Fed manufacturing data, the Richmond Fed manufacturing data, the yeah, consumer the data, confidence yeah. yesterday, last week, the PMIs, looking ahead to an ISM. A little no, bit later no this week. No question about that. With GDP, we look at a third look at first quarter today, I believe it is, with a negative statistic uh, there. John, George Cervellos moments ago does a fabulous publication on the linkage of dollar to recession guessing. And he makes clear there's no correlation, there's no guesstimate you can do, but the Deutsche Bank bet is a next large dollar move after we go into the recession is weaker dollar off the recovery out of the bottom of a recession. And Morgan Stanley thinks that we'll see that recession in Europe 
pretty soon. So let's talk about Europe just yeah. briefly. Take a look at the German curve, twos, tens, have a look at euro dollar as well. Yields came in in Germany by a lot more than one basis point early this morning because the regional CPI prints, the breakdown we got from region to region in Germany, were coming in a whole lot softer than Spanish <coughs> inflation shot higher into double digits. So look out for the German headline print in around about 90 minutes from now, going into the Eurozone headline number this Friday, with Euro dollar Tom basically unchanged on a session at 105.25. Yeah, the 105 thing is interesting, John. I don't have a strong feeling there. You know there's many other people looking for stronger dollar. Euro uh, gives his way as well. But for Mr. Bailey, I'm sorry. The fragility of pound sterling on a tick-by-tick -tick basis is tangible. It acts almost like bit dog. Tom, I've talked about this a few times in the last day mm. or so. This panel is really interesting. If there's some tension between the three of them that I think we can kind of tease out, it's got to be over the FX channel. Keep saying this. Chairman yeah, Powell has a strong currency. President Lagarde would like one. And I think that right now Governor Bailey really needs one. 120, uh, where am I on that? Excuse me, 120, down from the 122 level. Weaker pound sterling. Are we done? We're done. We were that done about 60 seconds check. ago. I appreciate that's, that, that's Tom. That's a very good you data get bonus check. round in 60 minutes. Steve Shiverone is taking notes, head of Multi-Asset <laughs> Solutions Federated Hermes right now. Steve, what have you changed here? I mean, the dynamics now, the nudginess, we have this panel today, but really the economic data tomorrow. How has Federated tweaked the 60-40 allocation? Significantly. Um, you know, we've been sellers really since last September. Um, and we took the opportunity with last week's rally, you know, growth had popped about 10% yeah. and we reduced, we reduced. So we're at 1% overweight equities, which is, you know, 61% equities right now, which is the lowest overweight time that we've had really since 2008, 2009. As you know, along with Steve Off and Phil Orlando, we've been one of the most bullish shops on the street really for the last decade plus. Um, but we're as, as low in our allocation right. of equities as we've been. And we mirror that on the fixed income side. We are underweight almost every major category of credit. In fact, not almost every major category of credit. Help. And that's really only the third time in the last 15 years. Help our radio and TV audiences that are saying, okay, underweight, translate that. Does that mean go to cash? It does, um, to a certain extent. So we've been, you know, our neutral allocation to cash in that 60-40 is roughly 3%. You know, we're sitting at eight, which is, you know, darn near three times our, our normal cash weight. So almost a triple levered cash fund, if you will. Um, there we go. I love it. <laughs> but I think, you know, there's going to be a time to buy longer dated treasuries as, as the recession, which we think is more and more likely, comes into view. The problem is I think the rally of the last couple of weeks in treasuries is still premature. I still think you're going to have upside surprises to inflation, a Fed that's hawkish, and a 10-year that ultimately moves back to that 3 and a, and a half percent rate. So we would look to add on treasuries as we move, as we sell off more, because I think you're going to want those longer-dated treasuries when you get into kind of worse growth periods. But right now, we think cash is, is king. Steve, let's take a step back and understand the framing of your bearishness and put on your uh, Federal Reserve thuggish hat in terms of commentating. Steve, you said before you came on that you think that they're in the midst of the biggest policy error going back to the 1930s. What exactly is their policy error? Yeah, I mean, I, and it, you know, to Tom's point, I think it's very understandable how they got there. I, mean, I don't think this is malfeasance, but I, when, when you woke up in March and interest rates were zero, Inflation was eight percent, and the you know Fed was still buying bonds. I, I don't care how you got there; that's policy error, um, and that has now forced them into a position right now where you know they're hiking aggressively, and they need to into a slowing economy. And I think what they missed, and, and Tom, you, you might find this interesting: what they missed is a longer-term structural change in the economy. We were in this kind of new normal, sub two percent growth, sub two percent inflation, sub two percent rate environment for a decade. The new normal. And just-in-time inventories are no longer just good enough. So companies are reorienting their, uh, their supply chains. Chinese working-age population is set to decline 20% over the next 20 years. And the U.S. population growth is set to go from 2% growth to 8% growth over that same period. And, so, and at the same time, you've, you've undermined the three pillars, at least for the short run, of globalization. The free movement of goods really kind of peaked with the trade war. The free movement of people peaked with COVID, yeah. and the free movement of finance may have peaked with this with this kind of economic war with Russia. And so I think 
you're headed to a scenario at the other side of a recession where you have higher U.S. growth, but it's less efficient. You're going to get more inflation so, per unit of growth. And that's a different world. Steve, this a lot of people would agree on, at least in the short term. But in terms of what happens next is the question. And there was a belief in the market perhaps last week that the Fed would ease off on rate hikes when they saw a dampening in some of the growth expectations and, frankly, uh, the underlying economy. We just heard uh, from Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Federal Reserve she doesn't see that happening, and she still sees a Fed funds rate well over 4% when it comes to next year. Do you think the market is mispricing that? Do you think that the turmoil that will ensue from that will confirm your bearishness and the reason why you're not ready to go full uh, throttle into longer duration yet? Yeah, I think the market has kind of contorted itself and had complacency multiple times over the course of the last six months where it's looking for peak inflation and peak Fed hawkishness. Which, you know, and I know you guys were talking about this yesterday, but if inflation goes from eight to seven, that's not a victory lap. You really need to get that number, you know, down, even if it's not quite to two, certainly, you know, pretty darn close to it. And so I think the Fed still has a lot of work to do in order to do that mm -hmm. because you've got service price inflation that's operating around eight, nine percent on a three month basis and wages are high. For that to come down, right. unemployment needs to rise. And I think they're going to have to go for some time. Right. Um, and if they do slow, Tom, I think they're slowing because it's abundantly clear that we've got a, you know, a significant decline in growth, if not an outright recession. How fast does the employment dynamic change? Jerome Powell said we have a strong economy in his testimony two cups of coffee ago. We've done a lot of work on this as part of our recession dashboard. And you can go, in fact, on average. It's a series of indicators that we look at that, I mean, there's no perfect formula to understand when a recession is coming, but there's guide frames that you can look at to try to understand. Um, on average, you can go from the cycle low in claims to a recession within 12 months. We hit a cycle low in claims three months ago. So it, there's no historic relationship between how strong a labor market is coming in in terms of how fast it can deteriorate. Um, and so... It's a fickle, it's a fickle friend uh, to rely solely on a, a strong labor force, and we may find that the excess inventory that we have this cycle was employment in certain sectors. And, and I think we've seen some of the tech guys already say we overhired, uh, whether that's Amazon or, or or Meta or some of the other folks that have said that. So I, I think, look, you, this idea that you're going to get through this by only making job openings disappear. Uh, that's a comforting thought, but I think it's ultimately going to prove to be overly optimistic. Hey, Steve, I just want to echo something you said earlier in the interview. If people aren't familiar with your work, to hear this from you, from Steve Orth, from Phil Orlando, it's quite something. You know, forgive the snark, but it's like Marko Kalanovic or JP Morgan coming out this morning and going, Max Bearish. You used I to mean, make fun of me for my snark around that. Steve, thank you. Steve Chevron of Federated Emmys. Steve, thank you very much. I mean, Lisa, though, seriously. John, that yeah. was to hear that, to hear that from Steve Orth <laughs> and Steve Chevron is something. They are seeing a new regime, a new paradigm. And we heard that from Steve Chevron, which was the reason why that historical perspective was so important. They see a shift that perhaps has not been fully recognized by the Federal Reserve or has, but just too late. TK? Oh, I'm just thinking, you know, you know, the way I look at this, every time I hear the word <laughs> paradigm, folks... <laughs> All my radar goes up. I don't think it's a new paradigm. I think we're coming out of a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. The gyrations are there, and the institutions will manage uh, this thing to some form of successful outcome. I just don't, you know, I look at the Bramo dime that's out there, and, and the, the, you know, it's a new Bramo dime, John. There's I'm, I'm lot, just pleased we've got the establishment view around the table with us too, Tom, <clears> because <throat> that is so establishment. What's the establishment? I, TK, that we're not I, in a new paradigm, you know, I, I, that they'll I get, get through this, they'll work it out. Tom, they've made a massive mistake. Uh, I think they were handed a horrific pandemic. And, you know, and frankly, as, as uh, James Burns Murdoch at the FT says in the last couple of days, the death rate of this pandemic has crept up just a little okay. bit. It's not inflammatory yet, but... You know, it's sobering to see us come off 300 deaths a day up to 350, 380 deaths. Without casting guilt or anything, because without a doubt, it was a very complicated time. No one can deny that people thought inflation had died in the past decade and everyone was wrong. 
everyone was vastly wrong. And suddenly people were talking about, remember when people were talking about printing money and helicopter money, John? And you could just throw sure. it out the window and yeah, it wouldn't totally. make a difference because totally. inflation was so dead it wouldn't get revived even I by that. I think Steve framed this really well. Yeah, I think so too. They were given a really tough hand. They were. Without a doubt. Then we all misread what would happen in 2020. Most people did anyway. But Tom, it's not about 2020. It's not even about the first six months of 2021. It's about the fact that we had five, six, seven percent inflation and this Fed kept doing QE. And they were okay. so slow to respond to it, I, Tom. Yes. That's what we're talking about, TK. No question. Not the bad hand they were given. I would suggest the real issue here is if they get to five percent inflation, then what? It's going to be extremely difficult to contain it from something in that vicinity. Futures this morning down about seven, <clears throat> negative two tenths of one percent from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Marissa Kigupta. The pressure is building more on the European Central Bank to raise interest rates for the first time in more than a decade. Inflation in Spain has unexpectedly soared to a record 10%. That beat all estimates in a Bloomberg survey, and it dashed hopes that inflation in Spain had peaked. And the European Union is effectively heralding the end of an era of internal combustion engines. EU members have endorsed a push to eliminate carbon emissions from new cars by 2035. Environment ministers struck a deal after Italy, the home of Ferrari and Lamborghini supercars, gave up demands for a five-year delay. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has declined the January 6th committee's request for her to testify. A lawyer for Virginia Thomas says that there is no sufficient basis for her to appear before the panel. Emails have indicated that her efforts to prevent Joe Biden from taking office were more extensive than previously known. Disney has given a vote of confidence to embattled CEO Bob Chapek. It's extended Chapek's contract for another three years. He's battled controversy and a crippling pandemic. At the same time, Chapek has spearheaded Disney's transformation into a streaming powerhouse. The entertainment giant is coming closer to overtaking the existing number one service, Netflix. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I wouldn't be surprised, and it's actually in my forecast, that growth will slip below 2%. But it won't actually pivot down into negative territory. That's the view from Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed president, in an event hosted by LinkedIn. We've heard the same story from Loretta Mester, Camp 75. They're in Camp 75 for a July rate hike of 75 basis points. Heard a similar story from John Williams of the New York Fed as well, Tom, this idea that they won't go into negative territory. He's expecting growth to slow probably yeah. to 1% to 1.5%. What's he supposed to say? Something like that. Tom, I'm with you. They're not going to forecast you know. a recession, are they? No. And then keep hiking interest rates. That's just <clears throat> not what they're going to do. I thought it was very responsible. I mean, it's all there is to it. And, of course, we'll drive forward the conversation with Francine Lacroix here. John, 900 now on that, nine right? zero zero, The yeah. open takeover, as it should be. Well, you know, okay. You know, as it should be. It, Looking big, forward to big it. Panel. It'll be, be interesting uh, to see. Right now, and this is your conversation to lean forward on the state of the Black Sea down to the Mediterranean. Julie Norman has a number of abilities at the University College of London Center on U.S. politics, but foundational is her academics on Arab Spring and on the terrorism of the Levant. She joins us uh, this morning. It's off the radar of America. Congratulations to the Washington Post for writing it up a few days ago and Bloomberg with a story here on Egypt in wheat. Julie, from Tunis to Cairo and then all eyes back up to Odessa and the wheat coming in from Ukraine, it's not working now. How urgent is the upset in Tunisia? How urgent is the pending upset in Egypt? Yeah, it's a good question, Tom. And I would say unrest in Tunisia in particular has been there since before this current crisis with the wheat, but that's kind of an ongoing thing. But in Egypt and in other parts of uh, uh, North Africa as well as Central Africa, we are really seeing the impact of food prices going up. Obviously, we're seeing that around the world, but in some of these areas where it really is a day-to-day -day, uh, struggle to get food for many people, um, this increase in food prices is literally causing uh, you know, extreme food insecurity. 
And at the same time, in some places, they're just not even the food coming in anymore. Wheat's obviously the uh, the big uh, import in terms of food, but also fertilizers, which is important for right. actually being able to, to spur the, uh, the agriculture locally. Short of landing Finnish and Swedish troops on Odessa to protect the flow of wheat, that's not going to happen. What is the to-do list for President Biden and others to assist in the movement of agriculture project, uh, products out of Odessa? Yeah, so there, this was a big focus for the G7 over these last few days, and that was one reason why they invited several other countries to be part of that and trying to ensure that there would be some kind of movement still. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very hard for Biden or for Western powers to ensure that. Um, as the crisis goes on, it becomes very difficult for Ukraine to be able to uh, harvest this kind of, uh, you know, wheat and agriculture, much less, much less export it. Um, and just the costs of doing so are, are rising so extensively. So what Biden and others are doing is really trying to look to other areas to shore up that supply while there is this uh, just very fast decrease coming out of uh, Ukraine and Russia. Julia, how much political pressure do you think is on some of the NATO members not to do the spending required to really remedy some of these issues, whether it's a troop buildup, whether it's protecting NATO nations, or whether it's helping to get wheat to countries that are really in desperate need of it, especially given the economic backdrop we're looking at? Yeah, well, it's a big issue for, for the U.S. and for, for all the countries that we're hearing talking about these tough decisions, because as we know from the U.S. context, Domestic economies are hurting. Everyone is seeing prices going up. Everyone is skittish about recession. And so even this week at NATO, where we're hearing about, uh, you know, uh, um, increasing readiness troop numbers of really trying to push weight behind Ukraine, this idea of even increasing defense spending, it's still very tricky among many NATO members. Uh, Boris Johnson has been pushing for it here in the UK, but even in the UK, there's a lot of resistance because of those domestic pressures that people are feeling. So trying to increase spending in all of these areas was, while also trying to protect the domestic economy, it's just a tough balance for almost any state to, uh, to hit right right now. Well, especially given some of the political pressures, since there is so much uh, potential contention around the way that people are feeling about inflation, and it brings us back to President Biden and what he's facing at home. How much extra support in some ways has he gotten from the social issues that have really galvanized a number of de uh, Democrats versus the antipathy represented by the poll numbers based on inflation and the economic backdrop? Yeah, so in the poll numbers for Biden are just abysmal right now. And what's interesting is that's not only among Republicans and independents, but also losing favor with Democrats as well. And I think that's largely because Democrats and the whole country are feeling these effects of inflation and of the economy. And at the end of the day, that's going to be where many voters are still uh, are still focusing going into November. With that said, obviously, the Supreme Court rulings, especially overturning Roe v. Wade, is something that Biden and Democrats will be leaning into to mobilize their own voters who maybe would have sat out in November and trying to push more on, uh, on that kind of issue for mobilization. But for many voters, the economy is still going to be front and center when it comes to November. Julie Norman, thank you of UCL. Wonderful to get your perspective on things on U.S. politics. And global politics too. Futures negative about a third of 1%. TK, Euro Swissy coming very, very close to parity this morning. Harkening back seven years, I believe it is, folks, to frame this for you. Strong Swiss franc is what the Swiss have lived with here. Everybody piling flows into Switzerland. That is a weaker statistic here from a 105, plunging down 104, 1.04. John, we plunged down to 1.00 with a leg down this morning, John. That would be a shock, a 0 0.99 Euro Swiss. We had that print a little bit earlier this year in the first quarter. Bramo, getting close to those levels again. What it speaks to, the difficulty in Europe, and I think the difficulties in Europe right now are pretty clear for everyone to see. Especially in light of the 10% Spanish inflation rate. How does the ECB get in front of this when they're lagging far behind the longer it takes for them to make a decision? How much does this really push ECB uh, President Christine Lagarde's hand? And how much do we hear about that today? We're behind. We're falling further behind. Perhaps we can front load some of these rate hikes. Swiss National Bank already making a move, exactly. right? Exactly. A big move. And the ECB still to get going some. The door open <clears throat> for many people well, to get going and then move maybe 50 basis points. And perhaps the door's <clears throat> open for that a little bit later <laughs> on in the next month or so. And John, what's sobering here is Kit Jukes writes moments ago, he'll join us here in about two hours pre that panel in uh, Portugal. What's sobering here 
is no one really saw this SNB action coming. When is the next SNB kind of surprise? We spend all our days, John, trying to measure out and think, think, think about what the probabilities are and outcomes. And then there's this move out of the blue, which is what we got from the Swiss National Bank. There are these two words that the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, keeps leaning on. Gradualism and optionality. <clears throat> yeah. It's the second word, Tom, whether I think it opens the door more to doing something around what you describe, which is something bigger. And if the inflation data leans in that direction, I don't think they're going to have much choice, given I, what we're hearing from other governing council members at the moment. I'd go in the mathiness of that. I'd go to something I think people understand, which is degrees of freedom, and they're running out of them rapidly. That's what happens with double-digit inflation, like in Spain. The data will set the tone for that conversation. We'll get headline data from Germany in about an hour from now. Then you'll get the Eurozone print this Friday, looking for a downside surprise on Germany based on what we had with the regional numbers through this morning. We'll get to that story a little bit later. Futures negative, a quarter of 1% this morning. Good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg. This is a Volcker-esque type of Fed, where they are clearly focused on getting inflation down. Co-inflation, food, energy, that whole thing is no longer transitory. It's very sticky, and they're worried. And there has been some signs that the economy is losing a little momentum. We actually think there's a 50-50 chance of recession in the next 12 months. If there's a recession, it's not going to be a massive recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A lot to look forward to this morning from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down about two tenths of 1%. TK, we're about an hour away, two hours away from the central bankers in Central Portugal. A lot of moving targets here, John, and very different stories from each of them. I think they will finesse to what they do not say. And I would say more than anything, particularly looking at the currency and what we'll see with Euro Swissy here on the data check is they're looking at foreign exchange as a litmus paper of an uncoordinated central bank system. And looking at economic data, Tom, that's starting to weaken stateside. We saw it in the Dallas yeah. Fed manufacturing, <clears throat> the Richmond Fed manufacturing, the consumer confidence data too. We saw it in the PMIs last week. Yeah, sterling gives way 121.59. Uh, I think that's a change overnight. And what I'm really watching is yen now out to 136.54. A 137 yen, John, would speak volumes to those Western central bankers. Bramo, at this point, what we're all waiting for now is not just the economic data, but the earnings and the company-specific stories that were said to hear from the JP Morgan's of this world from, say, July 14th, when earnings season really kicks into a high gear. And to put that July 14th into, uh, into some perspective, giving you a sense of how much capital markets have slowed down, U.S. IPO volume so far this year accounts for less than 6 percent of what we saw in the first half of 2021. Similar story in the U.S. high yield bond space. Capital markets have <clears> all but completely halted. How does that really speak to this lack of conviction and a lack of, of, frankly, forward guidance that we get from some of these earnings? Okay, but let's compare the capital market activity that we're seeing now to what we saw at the end of 2018. Is there any comparison yet, Lisa? Are you seeing that kind of level of stress? Actually, if you take a look, for example, at U.S. high yield bond issuance, it's $70 billion. That's nothing compared to what it has been over recent years. And better than just, zero, though. It's right? better than zero. This is not ground to a halt. But given how quickly rates have been rising, there is a fear, right, that if this continues for a year, two years, how do companies that finance themselves at 5% rates go to 11%? 12%. And that is a very real possibility. And suddenly people are thinking, how long can this possibly go on? And whether how can the Fed really get ahead of that? 520 on high yield spreads. And they've <clears> stayed <throat> wide. They've yeah. stayed elevated. They just haven't come in in the way that, say, equities have rallied over the last couple of weeks. We'll pick up on that with Stuart Kaiser at UBS in just a moment. Equities look like this. We're down about a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100. Negative around about a third of 1% too. Two hours away from Chairman Powell, President Lagarde and Governor Bailey sitting down with Francine Lacroix. Looking forward to that a little bit later this morning. Yields coming in about a basis point to 315.84 on a 10-year. Euro dollar just really not giving me much this morning, Lisa. Tom looking at Euro Swissy. Euro dollar 105.24 and unchanged on the day.
Yeah, very much looking forward to that panel. Before we get there, we do see all of the um, leaders of the NATO members, the NATO nations, going to Madrid for the NATO summit. We're going to hear from Jens Stoltenberg later this morning, 745, as well as in the 11 o'clock hour. Joe Biden also uh, going to be there. 9 a.m., very interested to hear this panel. It is the moment of the day. Uh, it includes ECB President Christine Lagarde, Fed Chair Jay Powell, Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, as well as the Bank of International Settlements head, Augustin Carson. Of course, moderated by our own Francine Lacroix. How much do they speak about the need to get ahead of inflation over the longer term, no matter what? How much do they speak to the prioritization of continuing to go at rate hikes, regardless of the data? This, to me, is one of the key questions at a time when people are getting increasingly concerned about inflation expectations becoming unmoored. And at 10.30 a.m., the latest read on the crude market, EIA crude oil inventory reports. This comes after we got some indications yesterday that inventory is still we're not building in the gasoline front, and it comes as diesel uh, rates still remain at record highs in the United States, really pressuring everything and being an inflationary input, John, not only to people driving around, but also to companies that need to transport those items. Bramo, thank you. That's where some of the inflation has been coming from, that's for sure. Joining us now in the studio, I'm pleased to say, is Stuart Kaiser, the head of equity derivatives research at UBS. Stuart, let's start here. This was the move you've been waiting for. We bottomed on the NASDAQ on about June 16th. We bounced quite aggressively off it. You've seen that at the single name level as well on some big tech cap stocks, big mega cap stocks as well. Can you walk me through on whether we've seen the move, whether you think it's more durable, it's got legs, and ultimately why? Yeah, it's a great question, Jonathan. You know, we did get a bounce off the bottom. Um, you could argue whether that's, you know, positioning based or actual actual data that's coming in. I, I think to make it sustainable, you're going to need to see a little bit of follow through in the inflation data, you know, over the next couple of weeks. We get, you know, we get PCE on the 29th and then you get CPI next month. So I think that's going to be... <clears throat> going to be the number one driver. I mean, if you really look what's happened to equity markets since late March, really, is you've had a significant decline in inflation expectations. But on the other side, you've had real rates higher and, and more restrictive, and you've had growth expectations kind of coming down a lot. And that sort of, you know, back and forth between inflation and growth data has really challenged things. So I think what the market's looking for here is for inflation to stabilize a bit, and, and hopefully that allows, you know, less restrictive policy to be priced into the system, which kind of takes down recession risks and on and on. And ultimately, that, that that's what you need for this to be more sustainable. Stuart, as my parents taught me about foreign exchange, I was a kid and I would kill to have it. I've lost it. I had a passbook from the Union Bank of Switzerland and made money on strong Swiss franc. That was a few years ago, like 54 uh, years ago. This is an historic moment right now. I certainly don't want you to speak for UBS and the politics of Switzerland, but I'm going to go Thatcher on you. Expect the unexpected. We are seeing shifts here. As, as one example, a national bank with 71 million shares of Apple going to parity moments ago on Euro Swissy. These, th these tectonic forces that we're seeing now are extraordinary. How do you fold them into an equity belief? Yeah, look, and, and that's a huge challenge to the markets. I think you're seeing that through interest rate volatility mainly. But, you know, coming into the year, that was the issue. You had, obviously, decelerating growth and rising inflation, but you had a policy regime shift. And that policy regime shift was clearly going to create macro volatility. Uh, we've seen that in equities with the VIX averaging over 26 for the year. You've seen it in FX volatility and high-yield volatility. So I think, to me, the how that's translated through to equity markets is, is we're not really sure where home base is, right? The risk-free rate has been so volatile. FX has been so volatile that it's hard to have a view on risk assets if risk-free assets are volatile. you lose money? Do you assume you lose money? Do you assume you lose money given what you just said about volatility? Um, look, I don't think you assume you lose money. I think you assume that your risk-adjusted returns are, are structurally lower than they have been the last couple of years. And what that's done to institutional investors is it's forced them to reduce the size of positions. Um, as Lisa commented before, that takes down liquidity in terms of tradable assets, and that creates more volatility, which kind of, you know, portends weaker risk-adjusted returns. So, I mean, I don't think you assume you lose lose money on a, on a nominal basis. But your your risk adjusted view on that, I think, is is just, you know, imp impeded pretty seriously. Stuart, we started the show talking about how the Fed is just the beginning of rate hikes. And that is from Loretta Master. And it's also from the fact that they really haven't raised rates nearly as much as they're expected to do so. Have the, has the market truly priced in a scenario where the Fed funds rate, as she says, is going to be at 4% by early next year? Or are people retracing too much in this belief that the Fed will you really ease off in the face of weakening economic data. 
You know, Lisa, I think you have to assume that was priced into the forwards and the rates market is accurately f reflected in equities, you know, with, with some risk premium to it. Um, I think to your point, though, equity markets and, and investors in general, I think are probably hoping that, you know, the Fed is being very aggressive to front load rate hikes. And, and as you mentioned before, to really talk inflation expectations um, and to keep those anchored. So I think you have, you have sort of a, a front loaded rate hiking cycle. You have an effort to keep in expectations anchored. And, you know, I think probably in the back of their minds, some investors are hoping that that once that happens and once inflation gets a little bit more under control, then they can ease up with a little bit of that rhetoric as the year goes on. But look, I, I think if it's priced into the bond markets, I think you have to assume that it's largely, you know, priced into the equity markets um, at this point. Stuart, do you assume then that the leadership comes from where the leadership was in a previous decade and that ultimately not much has changed? Is that your working assumption at the moment? Um, look, I think you know, for the second half of this year, I, I, th I think our view is is the things that have been hurt the most by higher inflation and higher rates are ultimately going to recover a little bit. I think you know the trick here, Jonathan, frankly, is is tech is underperformed significantly. But if you told me we are going into a recession in the next 12 months, where you want to get to want to put your money in equity markets? It's in defensives, it's in large cap, it's in strong balance sheets, and it's in high quality stocks. And frankly, that almost points you back into tech. And I think that's one thing that investors are, are struggling a lot with. You know, earlier in the year, they didn't want to own cyclicals because growth was slowing, but inflation was rising. So let's say force them into energy. Yeah. I think th they're going through a similar issue right now where they don't necessarily want to be in tech because it's sold off so much. But if you're really telling me growth is going to slow materially, that is a part of the market that you typically want to own. So I think that's one of the things that has driven the lack of conviction and, and sort of high volatility in markets. Stuart Kaiser, UBS. Thank you, Stu. Good to have you in the studio here in New York City and really plays into what we heard from JP Morgan this morning. They cut the price targets on a range of names, Snap, Google, Meta, Amazon, take your pick, went on to say, given macro pressures, we are increasingly cautious around the impact of a broader economic slowdown. Ad spending, <clears throat> the issue here, highly correlated with GDP. So to Stu's point, Lisa, it kind of makes sense to maybe look around tech, but certain pockets of tech, there's a very, very, very cyclical story embedded in some of those names. Well, they go on to say, though, I think this is interesting, and it's kind of the J.P. Morgan House view at the investment bank right now, isn't it? They think a lot of this is already priced. They think a lot of this is already priced and the bar is low. For other people, we haven't even started to price what some people fear is coming. Especially the bar has already been lowered so much for tech, and it's already been priced in if you think that people are going to go back into duration, right? I mean, this is sort of the other case for tech is if you believe eventually people are going to go back into longer dated bonds and bring down those rates, and tech once again looks pretty terrific on a just simply evaluation basis. Seen How some much? brutal calls this morning, haven't we? Can I talk about Carnival Please just briefly? Do. This is amazing. Tom, Morgan Stanley have come out with this call on Carnival, and I'll, I'll bring you just the snippet of it from the top of the page in the report. Listen to this. We cut our price target nearly in half. We introduce a, near, a new $0 bear case, given <laughs> escalating leverage, and remain underweight. Stock's down about 7% in the pre-market. I, I would go right to the leverage. I've always been amazed by the bond offerings. A $0 bear case. I mean, that's not. Can we call that a bear case? I can see surveillance. <laughs> <doing> <laughs> Do we need something more dramatic for when you we start to have a surveillance bear case? A, a zero dollar sort you know. of near end of the world experience for Carnival. Immediate <laughs> attention. Nice. Come on, we could do a <laughs> cruise. Case. We could strap on the old speedo and give lectures. That's that's my bear case, Tom. The idea of going on a cruise <laughs> with you guys. <laughs> <The> speedo. <laughs> Futures negative a quarter of one percent. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. NATO leaders are preparing to overhaul and boost the alliance's defenses in the face of Russian aggression in Europe. They want to establish a new force model that would put about 300,000 troops on high alert. President Biden says the U.S. will set up a permanent headquarters in Poland for the 5th Army Corps. NATO leaders are meeting in Madrid. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says the central bank is just at the beginning of raising interest rates to control inflation. Mester told CNBC she wants to see the benchmark lending rate reach 3 to 3.5 percent this year and a little above 4 percent in 2023, even if that tips the economy into a recession. But she doesn't see that happening. A former White House aide portrayed a violent and out of control Donald Trump in his presidency's final weeks. Cassidy Hutchinson gave the most gripping testimony yet in a House committee's hearings on the Capitol riot. But doubt has been cast on a key element of her second-hand account. Hutchinson says she was told the president tried to grab the steering wheel of his limousine after the Secret Service refused to drive him to the Capitol on January the 6th. 
and Tesla has laid off about 200 workers on its autopilot team at a facility in California. Bloomberg's learned the majority of those let go were hourly workers. Last week, Tesla CEO Elon Musk had outlined plans to cut 10% of salaried employees, but said he would be increasing hourly jobs. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. Today I'm announcing the United States will enhance our force posture in Europe and respond to the changed security environment as well as strengthening our collective security. Together, our allies, we're going to make up sure that NATO is ready to meet threats from all directions across every domain, land, air, and the sea. NATO is more needed now than it ever has been, and it's as important as it ever has been. Significant moves from the President of the United States from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovich. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures are negative about a quarter of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down a third of 1%. The data recently hasn't been great. You get these regional Fed manufacturing numbers, and they are not fantastic at all. You look at the PMIs last week, not brilliant. You look ahead to the ISM, and you expect maybe more of the same. Throw in consumer confidence, some weak stuff there. Yields lower by a couple of basis points again. Tom on a 10 year 315.47. Yeah, it's really important. Again, we're watching Euro Swissy for an historic moment to go through parity. We're almost there uh, right now. We'll discuss that uh, when it happens. What's going to happen at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, Wall Street Time today is a really important panel of what will be said and what will not be said. Among others, Jerome Powell and Christine Lagarde. We are advantaged by Anne Marie Horton in Madrid with Maria Tadeo in her Madrid, and there is a decisive difference here in the stories of Lagarde and Powell. In Spain, there is 15% unemployment amid 10% inflation, and in the United States, it is 4% unemployment amid 9% inflation. Maria, let me go to you first here. What does Lagarde not want to do today on fragmentation? What does she want to be silent on as Francine Lacroix grills her? And, and, and Tom, 10% inflation in a country like Spain, this was a big talker today. This is really what people talk about in this country. Where you get in a taxi uh, to come to NATO, the sad reality for a lot of the Ukrainian effort here is that the people are not debating the war in Ukraine or how to help Ukraine win the war, but the fact that, of course, fuel has risen so much over the past two months that it is becoming a problem for a lot of people in Europe. And this is before the winter. That's when everyone here agrees things will get really difficult for the European economy. I think for Christine Lagarde, it really is about not giving too much detail away on that fragmentation tool. Yeah. Wait for uh, the July summit. Again, the rate hike, there's a lot of conversation about how fast she's going to go on that front. But I think she's really want to signal now that the ECB is in a position to aid tame inflation, but also set up policy right. for 19 countries that are very different by nature, which is a very difficult job. Emory, Joe Biden has to worry about one country on unemployment and inflation. He will fly back to the joy and the worry, the angst of moving from 4% unemployment, dare I say, higher. How will he address that in fractious Washington? Well, he's been trying to address it while he's been abroad, making sure that all his foreign policy go goals, he pivots to why it's important to the United States. This was really a big talking point at the G7 in the Bavarian Alps, because as Maria said, while these leaders are gathering together to try these efforts, to help these efforts in Ukraine, what actual people on the ground are talking about across the board are higher consumer prices. When you look at inflation, it's really groceries, it's gasoline. These are things that are, are worrisome. So the president really needs to make sure that while he does deliver these foreign policy messages, and we should know today was a big goal for him strategically. About a month ago, I was in the Rose Garden when he said that Finland and Sweden need to be a part of NATO. They meet every requirement and then some. This is something he was able to achieve 
But is it going to be overshadowed with this list and all of these problems he has at home? The party is pushing for him to do more on uh, women's reproductive right. Of course, after the Supreme Court struck down uh, Roe v. Wade, then you, of course, you have overshadowing a lot of the American public and media right now was that testimony yesterday out of the January 6th. And then, of course, it's inflation. These are the issues he has to face while he's also meeting with these leaders in Madrid. Maria, how much daylight is there between world leaders when it comes to fighting inflation, given that all nations are facing a similar issue? It rhymes, but it's not the same. It's not the same, but Lisa, if I, if, if I may actually, we now know that President Zelensky was uh, on a video conference with uh, NATO leaders and he said today the top priority for you at this point uh, should be, of course, to improve and strengthen NATO, but also to help uh, Ukraine win. And when we say win, we mean on the battlefield. So we want to need uh, more weapons and it hopefully comes out of this meeting. That is uh, the message from President Zelensky. And in terms of the economy, look, I think that for the Europeans now, it is very clear that this is going to be a very very difficult winter. They worry particularly the Germans and the Italians if Vladimir Putin is going to cut off uh, the gas. And for the time being, the impression that we get is that Europe feels we've done a lot to help Ukraine on the financial front. The sanctions for the time being need to stop because we really need a breather, especially because they try to get in good shape ahead of September with the storage of energy before the winter. That is really the concern for everyone here. To the two of you, absolutely fantastic, as always. Seriously, we joke around a lot, but two of the best international correspondents in the business, Anne-Marie Hordern alongside Maria Tadeo. Thank you, guys. If I can mention one thing, John, quickly. Sure. <laughs> if you don't mind, if I can mention one thing, while we talk about gasoline prices at home really dodging this president, Yesterday, me and the producer, Jason Hoffman, filled up our tank before we gave back our car at, at the airport. It was $7.64 per gallon of gasoline in German. It's about $10 in the United Kingdom. So these inflation concerns are even more dramatic in Europe. I was just saying how great you are, and then you cut us off. Anne-Marie, thank you, as always. Anne-Marie Hordern, alongside Maria Tadeo. Lisa, I wanted to pick up on what you were talking about because I think it's so important. When the three of these individuals sit down a little bit later this morning, when we hear from President Lagarde, Governor Bailey and Chairman Powell, President Lagarde, in some ways, and she's been diplomatic about it, she has actually revealed the differences between what the US is experiencing and what Europe is experiencing. And she talks about the more robust fiscal response that we had in America too. And I just wonder if that's something that comes up in the conversation a little bit later. In what tenor, though? And this, I think, will be interesting. Is it to say we don't have to go as hard as the U.S. and we can still see some sort of transitory light types of inflationary impulse that rolls over because of the lack of strength in the United States? Or is it to say uh, that we can actually afford to spend more and we can go further? I mean, how is she going to use those differences to really draw a distinction in the policy that they then put out? It's okay. Your thoughts on what's about to happen in the next 90 minutes or so? It's what they don't say. It's absolutely what they don't say. There's going to be a lot of talk, but these guys are pros. Francine's going to ask them some tough questions, and uh, you, I think you're going to be shocked. And I like the idea that one of you said that fragmentation is really not going to come up in detail uh, with Lagarde. But, I mean, Powell is just going to try to get out of this unscathed. They're in a tough spot. Kit Jukes of Sock Gen is going <clears> to join <throat> us later. This yeah. is what he had to say about the Swiss National Bank. Caught between an Alp and a hard place. But TK, up. that's the line from Kit this morning as Euro-Swiss test parity all over again for the second time this year. I think that's a song Barry sang at the piano bar. Is that right? A couple years ago. A few drinks in. Yeah. I was alongside you. Futures down eight on the S&P. We're down about two tenths of one percent. It was in two basis it's like points. A Christopher Cross song. On a ten year. Between an help and a hard Three, praise. Fifteen. <laughs> oh, don't da, let da, me da, stop da. you. Carry on. Da, da, da. <laughs> okay. Any drums in that? The, no, the, but, uh, the, I think Jeff mm. Percaro did the drums, actually. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You get bored of listening to the Perma Bears and the Perma Bulls, but when you hear someone who's been bullish for the best part of 10 years say that what we're seeing from this Federal Reserve is the biggest policy mistake since the 1930s, I think it gets your attention. And that's what we heard from Steve Chevron of Federated a little bit earlier this morning. He is very cautious on this market. Futures right now down two tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down around about a third of 1%. And the data so far over the last couple of days has not been great. We've talked about the Richmond Fed manufacturing number, dreadful. The Dallas Fed manufacturing number, 
pretty dreadful. And the Conference Board Consumer Confidence number, not great either. You add in the PMIs from last week, look ahead to the ISM. You can see why maybe people are starting to think about even more so looking at the long end of the yield curve. Twos, tens and thirties look like this. We had a sniff of 325 yesterday. We came back in. Tens are down a basis point at 315.84. And one of those looking at the longer end of the yield curve may be sovereigns, developed market sovereigns to be specific. Max Kettner over at HSBC. Very cautious on risk assets. One, on high yield credit. Two, on equities. And much more constructive on what's going to happen here in bonds. Perhaps that's your view. Maybe others, Brammer, would push back, given that this time is very, very different, isn't it? It's not just about lower growth expectations. What do you do with the inflation piece of that story as you look ahead as well? How much is this about Fed credibility and central banks being able to get inflation under control and then overshooting, perhaps, and giving duration back a bit? If you take a look at longer-term inflation expectations, they confirm the Max Kettner view of things because they've been coming down rapidly over the past few weeks. We'll hear from those central bankers in around about 90 minutes from now, sitting down with Francine Lacroix, Chairman Powell, President Lagarde and Governor Bailey. And this is going to be important, particularly for Europe. Take a look at this. We'll finish on European bonds and take a look at the German curve, say twos and tens. Your two year right now comes in a couple of basis points, down three. And Tom, that's off the back of these regional German CPI prints that were a bit softer than expected. But as we talked about with Maria and Anne-Marie, Spanish inflation into double figures puts the ECB in a little well. bit of a tough spot. Yeah, and it going goes, to their next meeting. And the fragmentation is what she's not going to want to talk about. I guess that policy coming out in a number of days, if not uh, weeks. But, John, it's radically different, and the polarities there, and I know we look at the Italian-German uh, difference in yield as sort of the litmus paper, if you will, of a system, and they've actually been sort of quiescent, but I don't buy it for a minute. I think there's massive country-by-country -country challenges there. And again, a region at war. That the Italian-German spread that you bring up, Tom, that's coming from about 240 at the wides, yeah. all the way back in, sub-200, pushing around about 180. Well, so a bit move, more behave this you know, time you around. Move on your sabbatical, you move the needle on GDP. Is, is that what happened? You know, I brought spreads in. Yeah, you Thanks for that, Tom. When are you going to let this go? Uh, You've got to take a vacation you know. sometimes, Tom. It's good for you. You take a breather. I know you like the European way secretly. Yeah. I know you do, uh, which is why you love I, talking about I'm Euro Swiss on, and all I'm, things European. I, I, I'm going on a holes when Romain goes holes. on holes. You're going to call it a holes? How do you call it? A holiday. Holes. A holiday. You can halls. call it a holes. Yeah, yeah. Or a vacation if you... It's not cough yeah. medicine. Don't you like holiday? Doesn't that make sense, Lisa? Doesn't that yeah, work? But just halls sounds like it's resonate? cough medicine. Okay. All right, are we done? I think we're done. <laughs> I think we're I think done. that's my decision. <laughs> Remains, asset price action looks like, like this. Remain, this. I don't know how much we pay him to I, turn I'm up this early in the morning <laughs> to, to tune in for this. You guys can keep going. Remain, do you get a bonus yeah. for tolerating this? No, apparently it. not, but thanks for, uh, for reminding me that I need to talk to uh, Mr. Al uh, here. Let's get a quick check here uh, on the broader market, guys. We talked yesterday about all the weakness that we saw in the market. A lot of that drag came from those big cap tech stocks, and that's pretty much the story here in the pre-market. Not quite as severe as what we saw in the cash session, but definitely something to keep Keep an eye on Tesla shares uh, down about a percent here on the day, setting up for a third day uh, of declines here. Uh, of course, on this penultimate day of the first half, the first half, the seen Tesla shares now down about 33 percent. I want to bring your attention, though, to some of the macroeconomic conditions and the idea that you have a lot of stocks out there that some people think sort of are recession proof. We got two interesting earnings, one out of McCormick, the spice maker, and one out of General Mills. And these stocks are going in opposite direction. General Mills surprising to the upside. Those shares up to and a half percent. Organic net sales growth coming in at 13 percent. Food service growth was up 25 percent and their margins and everything else really just blew it out the water with regards to expe uh, with regards to analyst expectations. General Mills did talk about inflationary pressures but said they were able to navigate that. Meanwhile we heard from McCormick which was talking about those same inflationary pressures and apparently they weren't able to navigate that. They actually posted a surprise decline in sales and more importantly their gross margins contracted by almost five percentage points. Those shares down seven percent here on the day. I'll flip it up. I got a couple stocks here uh, for you, Tom, as you uh, prepare uh, for your holiday season here. Uh, keep there an eye on Pinterest. I know you're a big Pinterest guy. Uh, changing up the guard there. The C uh, CEO yeah, and also the founder of the think? company. What was he pushed out? I don't know if he was pushed out, but he's been there for some time, and there's been a lot of concerns by investors that uh, maybe he wasn't the person to continue leading this company. He is stepping aside. He's going to stay with the company, Tom, so don't worry. He'll be there as an executive chairman. CK loves but Pinterest. But they're building in Bill Ready. Uh, yeah, Tom. I mean, can, you, can you tell me what Pinterest does? Because I still don't know. It's an advertising-based platform, uh, John, What do, what do you, you do on it, though? You could plan out your wedding, Tom. You could plan out your holiday. That's I mean, Tom, when you're getting ready I, to go on your holiday, okay. you want to find a nice shirt, I, John, pair of shorts, flip-flops. I, I yeah. studied it for social media. I was asked at Bloomberg to study it. Have we got a Tom Keen account on Pinterest? Study it. Oh. 
I, <laughs> the there may be some debris out there, but John, yeah. I never figured it out. Yeah. It's hugely female and it has a real geographic uh, bias to the Keep Midwest. Keep going, some. I mean, <laughs> no, it's true. I we all want to know. What, yeah. what does that mean? Hmm. I, I don't know. It's, it's like <laughs> planning weddings, just like Romaine said. Well, Why Tom, yeah, I mean, you, you know. Event, Lisa, sure weigh in here. No, no, Lisa's just digging. letting this go. Lisa, She's just giving you, well, Lisa, you're Ramo's just giving you more rope. Ramo's just giving you more rope. Carry on, TK. Please. Want to keep I, going? I think I'm, no, I'm done, guys. Uh, Coinbase <laughs> down 2%, Tom. I know you care about that, too. Tom might be back in the next Happy segment. Happy holidays, guys. We'll find out in about yeah. five minutes. Romain, thank you. You're welcome, Romain John. Bostick, we appreciate it. I'm and glad we look that forward to the close. Yeah, I'm glad Romain yeah, mentions later. General Mills. I weighed into the General Mills piece there, the nine-year piece. Back then, it was a 10-year <laughs> piece at a 102. I'm enjoying it this morning at an 81. Have That's you called Price that Down, Yield Up. <laughs> Got it right. It's greatly Kathy female. Jones here so I can yell at her because she told me to get you, into you bonds there. there. She fixed income strategist at Charles Schwab. Kathy, that's the reality. Not a bunch of bond strategists talking about spreads and credit quality. People listening and watching bought a piece at par, and they're enjoying it at 81 or 82, like the General Mills two and a quarter of 31. What do you do if you own that bond? Well, you have two choices, Tom. One is you hold it to maturity, and it goes back to par, because that's what bonds do unless there's a default. Or you sell it now, take your tax loss, and replace it with a higher yielding bond. Kathy, when does the concern start to creep in that we're not seeing issuance really pick up and that a lot of companies can choose not to now, but maybe in six months and certainly in 12 months, it'll be less of an option? Yeah, I, you know, I think right now uh, corporate balance sheets are still among the investment grade community still pretty strong and they don't they did load up on debt at lower yields. Um, so they're in pretty good shape, but we'll probably see issuance pick up. There's always going to be a window uh, open, um, you know, later on in the year as we get into next year, there will have to be some refinancing that takes place. I think a lot of the issuance now is just waiting for yields to come back down. Do you think that they will? I mean, that's the issue. If they don't come back down, they're looking at financing costs that are double what they were uh, potentially just a couple of years ago. How much does the need for it to come down really determine the next default cycle? Well, I think when you're talking about high yield or certainly bank loans, um, then you have a problem with short rates moving up, particularly in the bank loan sector, because they adjust. The duration is very short. They adjust very rapidly. And for those companies, which are basically junk companies, um, their cost of financing is going to jump, you know, 40, 50 percent. And that is one reason right. we're not uh, big fans of bank loans right now. I think it'll also hit the low end of the high yield market uh, because, you know, spreads have moved up a bit here, but they're probably going to move up some more. We think there's a high risk of recession, particularly if the Fed goes really right. uh, hard and fast the way they're talking about. And that's not going to be good for the high yield market. An historic moment for Global Wall Street. We interrupt with Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Euro Swissy plunges through parity uh, right now. Strong Swiss franc. And that is an unexpected off what SNB did a number of days ago. Kathy, that speaks volumes of the unexpected out there. What is the unexpected if the Fed moves 75 beeps in July or onward? Well, I think it does translate into the FX market. Um, obviously, if the Fed goes 75, that's built into the market. And I think a fair amount of tightening is built into the market. If, the, if Loretta Mester gets her 4% next year, um, then I think that we're seeing an inverted yield curve, all else being equal. It'd be very difficult with the economic indicators rolling over that to see yields move up from there, I think you've seen inverted curve. And that translates when we look at, say, the Japanese bond market and where the yen is and what's happening in Europe, that's going to translate into a pretty stiff global tightening cycle. And uh, that's when things break. Kathy, thank you. You're one of the best. I love hearing from you. Kathy Jones there. And there's the Schwab. Thank you. Break, Tom. That's when things break. Yep. Here's the yes. choice that the s and faces, according to Kit Jukes. Either, and the choice is simple, he says, they intervene in whatever size the markets demand or let the franc fly through Euro-Swiss parity and overshoot. Is that the beginning of that right now, Tom? 
Well, it, it, it is. And of course, they've been very creative with equity ownership. I mentioned the Apple shares, I believe, 71 million uh, earlier, John, but it's much more than Apple. They're basically running a sovereign wealth fund uh, within the SMB. I guess that Mr. Jordan can correct me on that, but that's sure what it it, it looks like. Each country, and it, it, Francine's panel, John, each country has its own challenges, but I'm going to say this, and I'm not just saying this because, you know, you know how much I love John, but United Kingdom is exceptional here. It is where people have secondary ownership. It's where they travel to. The city is the global financial center. And, and Governor Bailey on this panel today is not only for the United Kingdom, but international as well. As a case study, I agree with you, Tom. But do you think as a, from the perspective of consequences and spillover, potential no, spillover? No, it's always Powell. That's Powell and the yeah, guard. it's always it? Powell. Still. Yeah, still. I, I, yeah, I, I mean... You know, you look at the unexpected. We're looking at Euro Swissy. We're looking at Finland and Sweden and NATO. John, these are things I never fathomed in my life. I just can't wait for your Pinterest coverage in the next segment. That'll be fun. Well, you know. You're going to give us a price target. I don't even know how to log on anymore. Let me see if I can <laughs> log on on the break. I went on that website maybe once, Bram. I've got no idea what I'm doing there. <clears throat> Zero. Was it mood boards log or something? In. You know, I've got to be honest, even though I am female, I have never, never logged on never either. Gone no. on it. I'm sure people share that view. Your kids are on Pinterest, Bramo. I don't think so. <laughs> Doesn't he do Nike? Yeah, yeah. Rare Nike sneakers yeah, he's, on Pinterest. He's more, yeah. Futures down a tenth on the S&P. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishikhe Gupta. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will meet with President Biden to push for the purchase of new F-16 warplanes. The two will talk during the NATO summit in Madrid. Erdogan is now seeking to capitalize on a relatively positive atmosphere in relations with NATO and the U.S. Ties had grown cold after Turkey brought advanced Russian air defense systems. The pressure is building more on European Central Bank to raise interest rates for the first time in more than a decade. Inflation in Spain has unexpectedly soared to a record 10% that beat all estimates in a Bloomberg survey and it dashed hopes that inflation in Spain had peaked. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has declined the January 6th committee's request for her to testify. A lawyer for Virginia, Thomas, says there is no sufficient basis for her to appear before the panel. Emails have indicated that her efforts to prevent Joe Biden from taking office were more extensive than previously known. And Disney has given a vote of confidence to embattled CEO Bob Chapek. It's extended Chapek's contract for three years. He's battled controversy and a crippling pandemic. At the same time, though, Chapek has spearheaded Disney's transformation into a streaming powerhouse. The entertainment giant is coming closer to overtaking the existing number one service, Netflix. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The 120, 130 levels, you begin to really start getting that pain threshold. And then we got that before, before it started coming off again. So I think that's the target you're looking at. 125, 130 is really when you start seeing demand destruction to kicking in. Kona Hag there, the head of research at EDF Man. Fantastic to catch up with her. Always is. Futures just about negative. Bouncing off the lows, we're down by 0.06% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 0.15. Things improve. Yield to lower by a basis point, 315.84 on a 10-year. Bill Ackman, the hedge fund investor, out on Twitter this morning, Tom, oh. says the following. Business is a confidence game. CEOs are losing confidence because of uncertainty due to the perceived risk of sustained high inflation. He goes on to say the Fed must act decisively to subdue inflation and inflation inflationary expectations, then business confidence will be restored. That's the view from Bill Ackman this morning, something he said a few times well, over the last few weeks. That's in the textbooks and very Greenspanian. And, and, and what I would suggest to it is this new word, John, and maybe you'll hear it in this panel. I don't think so. It's sort of a Bullard-esque word is front-loading. We're front -loading. We've been talking about this on surveillance for months. TK, I think front -loading. there's something that will come up. Because yeah. that's uh, that's some of the theory. Just get it done. That's some of the theory. I agree with you. Get it done kind of thing. Well, here's what we're going to do. We've mentioned it, oil up 6% off the bottom really now. Uh, Brent crude 119. Excuse me. I missed that, John. 118 up to 119.23. Enough to get Will Kennedy on. Bloomberg executive editor for energies and commodities as well. 
Will, I want you to talk about something I learned in school, which is Blasian demand destruction. This is the demand destruction that Javier Blas writes about. Are you seeing demand destruction across Europe when Javier Blas tells me that Netherlands natural gas is over 200 equivalent dollars of Brent barrel? Is it evident out there yet, demand destruction? Perhaps at the margin, Tom. I don't think there's been widespread demand destruction. We've seen uh, some heavy industry close down. The UK, for example, has lost a fertilizer plant. Um, it had two, now it only has one. Uh, that's been closed permanently. Fertilizer, of course, one of the most uh, gas intensive industries out there. We'll no doubt see more if prices stay at these levels, and, and, and they probably will. But the other thing I would tell you is that it's uh, summer and gas demand really isn't at its highest and where we're going to see the impact is going into the winter uh, where people are going to have very tough choices about how much to heat their homes and they're likely to be colder than they were last winter. And, and Brent Crude, what is our reporting of the significance of going through whatever the daily moving average kind of high is? I'm looking here, Will Kennedy, right now, and I know it's like a 127, 128, but really the peaks have been, we're almost there, like a 124 as well. What will be the significance of a 125 print? I think we're looking at a, a resurgent oil price here. One of the things that I would say about oil right now is that when you look at the time structure, the relative value of contracts across the curve, people are really pricing the front, of, front month, the front of the curve, really, really strongly. Uh, and that's telling you there's a lot of desire for barrels right now that refiner, yeah. refiners are willing to pay up. Um, and I think that you know, it can attack those levels that you discussed uh, quite quickly. And of course, once they go through them, that often gives a bit of a surge. So, you know, there, there is a bullish argument to make from these levels, Tom. Yeah. And, and Lisa, Michael Tran with Halima Croft at RBC was blistering today about asymmetric calls of where you go to 150. And he even mentioned above 150. He, you know, he alluded to that, Lisa. Which raises the issue of demand destruction, which so many people have been looking for as the uh, remedy for some of the high prices. Will, how much are we already seeing that? And I'm pointing to the conference, for conference board's uh, survey that it put out yesterday, showing that people were ratcheting back plans for road trips and even for for just general vacations over the next six months. Yeah, that was a very interesting piece of data, Lisa. As you say, people have really changed their expectations of how much they're going to drive this summer. And if that, if that comes true, then obviously demand will be lower than otherwise thought. But we're not seeing that necessarily in the market yet. The American refining industry is still working as hard as it can to produce gasoline and diesel, suggesting that customers uh, are willing to buy whatever they can produce. Um, and refining margins remain extremely strong. We've been a bit starved of data because we had this server blow up at the EIA last week. So we haven't had any data for uh, almost two weeks. We'll get some this morning and I think traders will be very interested to see what the latest demand figures are for petroleum products in the US and whether they see any softening of the normal seasonal pattern. Well, as NATO members meet, they're talking about possibly capping the price of Russian oil as you try to parse through what exactly they're trying to do. Do we have a sense of what the consequences could be on the price of crude? It's a very uh, difficult question to answer, Lisa. And of course, as you say, the scheme itself is quite complicated and it requires uh, the use of the insurance market to basically insist on a price for Russian crude. I think that when you look to what happened at the G7 yesterday, it was an instruction to examine this idea more, which is a way of really kicking it into the long grass. I think that many people out there think it's going to be too complicated and that uh, Russia will find ways through insuring the cargoes itself, for example, of bypassing it. So it's hard to see this happening in the short term, at least. And that makes it very hard to see what the uh, impact would be on the on the crude price. It would depend how Russia responded. Would they go along with it and get what price they can or would they uh, say, well, we're not going to play and take more oil off the market? I, I, I think those things are very uncertain. Super complex. Well, a clinic from you, as always. Thank you, sir. Will Kennedy out of London. Just looking at the shares of Bed Bath & Beyond getting hammered in the pre-market. There's an executive change. The numbers, Lisa, they're really not great. Yeah, at a, jo all. 
adjusted loss per share, $2.83 versus the expectation for a five cent year over year uh, gain. Just wow. overall, not only is it bad in terms of what they have seen, but what they expect to see. And how much does this come down to inventory and planning for an environment where people are buying very different items than they were six months ago? How do you plan for that in advance in the fast moving pandemic backdrop? When do they get put out of their misery? I mean, they're negative 16% per year for the last 10 years. They're making, John, well, forget about the losses they're making. Even at the EBITDA line, it's pennies per dollar. Do you want my amateur customer feedback, Tom? I don't know. There is way too much in that store. (laughs) Way you too much. I've heard his Bed Bath and Beyond gripes. Way just too much. I, I hear you. I mean, you. seriously, you go in there and it's just overwhelming. I mean, I, I'm looking Full like as a CFA stuff. exercise. You look at their income statement and you go, really? Well, the sales are down 23% in the first quarter, Tom. Mark Shritton, didn't he come over from Target, Lisa? Wasn't he meant to sort some of this stuff out? Well, Target's having its own problems, right? I mean, how much are you seeing the tale of different retailers wow. that planned accordingly in terms of how much they stocked up for a very different period in terms of what people are buying, how much they're going to have to actually discount, how much they're dealing with higher uh, employee turnover, all of these issues that each company really had to deal with, and some did it all right and some didn't. <clears throat> Final word on Pinterest. Lisa, you want yeah. to squeeze that in? I'm gonna I'm actually gonna bail Tom out here. Are you we ready? Were, yes, I am. Okay, because you know, we were making fun of him for saying, you know, overwhelmingly female. Sport. But it actually is, you know, and as oh of January God. 2022, 77% of Pinterest's audiences were female. The TK said he'd done a study. So evidently you, did, you he read, had. did you read I his was study? asked John, I read this years study ago by one keen to do T. Pinterest. I mean, I've deleted the account, but like <laughs> to do Pinterest to study to do if it. there was an audience. What and is we it? Deter- there isn't. Did an you do activity? a mood board? There, there isn't. Did you an make audience. a mood board? No, it was me and you know Sarah and you know it's, it's it, it was it was years ago. Okay. All right. Futures are up to a tenth of one percent higher, Tom. We're an hour away from Chairman Powell on a panel in Sintra, Portugal. financial conditions is part of the Fed's solution to the inflation problem, which means, of course, the market will go lower. We're not yet seeing any elevated signs of credit risk that would suggest a problem. We're going to see a pickup in macro volatility. We are seeing that. I think this is real and persistent. There is a path to a soft landing. It's perhaps narrower than many of us would want it to be. A high probability of a hard landing. I'm not convinced we're priced for that. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keane on radio, on television. Not your average Wednesday. No question about this. Yes, economic data tomorrow. But, John, economic data in one hour. Francine Lacroix speaks to the world's central bankers. What a lineup, Tom. Chairman Powell, President Lagarde, Governor Bailey sitting down with Francine. And we've got a couple of questions, haven't we? How much damage will that inflict on this economy? How much will they tolerate higher inflation for how long? Tom, you've talked about that move down from eight, perhaps down towards 5%, 4%, 3%. These are the kind of things we need to try and tease out going into 2023. David Rosenberg with a blistering note out of Toronto this morning saying, let's go. This is the front-loading concept. You wonder if that's going to come up. Let's get it done. Let's raise race to get the first tranche of inflation slowdown to happen. Loretta Mester on board of the Cleveland Fed. Let's go 75 again. President Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed on board. Let's go 75 basis points all over again. It's not just about the Fed now, Tom. It's about the ECB as well. They're set to make a move. They're tearing us up for 25. Will they have to go a little bit more? German CPI inflation coming in at 8.2%. The median estimate was 8.8%. That data's just come out. We had a little bit of a lead into that from the regional CPI prints out of Germany earlier this morning. Yeah. Looking for that downside surprise. You'll get the headline number, Tom, this Friday. And the idea of double-digit inflation in Spain, obviously very, very uh, different. Lisa, it leads up to looking at the tea leaves and the killer tea leaf right now is Brent crude exploding out. What was it? 115 out to a 119 level up 1.1 percent. A different story than it was last week when people yes. believed that yes. there was going to be some sort of uh, economic <clears throat> downturn that would reduce demand significantly for oil. That lasted about mm, five minutes as people went back to realizing the actual market was really tight. I do want to just to pick up on something, Tom, you were talking about earlier, the Euro, Euro Swissy on the heels of that inflation 
inflation data that John was talking about. You see it move back just a little bit. How much does the ECB dovetail this nuanced picture of inflation, a nuanced picture of economic deterioration in Europe with a call of being hawkish enough to support the euro? And how much is that going to be the main theme out of this potential panel, Tom? Let's get to the data check. We've got an important guest here. Can Kit Jukes to join us later in the hour from SockGen on that uh, panel. John, I'm just going to look at a bit of a reversal here with green on the screen. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a nudgy tape is how I'd scientifically call it, John. Just a bit of a lift. We'll use your word, a nudge higher, Tom. Nudge. Up a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up a third of 1% also. <clears throat> Yields in a couple of basis points. That's been the story over the last couple of days. We had a little look at 125, 325 rather, on a 10-year. Still not used to that three handle. We had a little look at <clears throat> 325 in the last 24 hours and then backed away. Largely, Tom, because the data just has not been great stateside over the last few weeks. Yeah. And, and again, this inflation trend. John, what do you make of the German inflation number there? I mean, expected after it's... we saw the regional print, Tom. There's a story about travel <clears throat> and train tickets in there that yeah, have pulled things lower okay. just a little bit. Does it change the mood music or just the volume on the mood music? I think it changes the right. volume. It doesn't change the track. It's the same story for this ECB. They've got work to do. John and Lisa are going to pick it up here with Aaron Brown. She's multi-asset strategies, portfolio manager at PIMCO. But Aaron, I need to digress. We had Abby Joseph Cohen on with us eight, nine, ten days ago. And I think of the work that Sally Krawchuk has done with us over uh, the years. No no one I know is as invested in girls as you are in finance with girls who invest. You've really put some quality time into that. Tell us where the momentum is now with girls who invest getting more women into this business. Sure. So we've spent a lot of time really focusing on those very early onset years and trying to build a pipeline for more women. Well, into like finance. seven or eight years old, or are you going no. a, little, a little older? <laughs> we're, so we're starting a little bit older. We're starting with <laughs> sophomores in college, really priming them for being prepared to enter the workforce as they start to move into their junior and senior years and really look at the industry holistically to really attract women as investors into the business. So not just looking to hire yeah, women and, into finance, but really <clears throat> specifically as investors. And Lisa, what this is about is enjoying losing money early on <laughs> so you become adult about it and actually get to work on it. Equal opportunity to lose money in a market that's increasingly <clears throat> unclear, Aaron. When you talk to individuals, women and others, as they come into the market, how do you try to frame the moment at a time when uncertainty seems to be the catchphrase for everyone and people are looking at potentially a new, and I'm doing this just for you, Tom, a new paradigm for inflation and growth. Absolutely. And I think that's really what we're seeing right now, which is a transition point in the market. This isn't a market unlike we've ever seen before. And I think that these growing pains and this volatility really does create opportunity. You know, certainly we've seen real violence in the markets year to date, but we're now getting to levels, particularly outside of equities. But when you look at fixed income markets that you know, optically at least are the most attractive that they've been in a very, very long time. I mean, with 10-year bonds now yielding, you know, upwards of 3% and even cash rates offering pretty chunky yields, it's the first time where you can actually feel like fixed income off you know, actually offers value well, in markets. And Aaron, I know that PIMCO has come out with this call that there's starting to be a lot of value, particularly even in duration. And I'm wondering how you frame this out in terms of near-term versus long-term uh, bonds, where in the world you would go for uh, duration and how much you are fully invested. I mean, how much is your conviction in this fixed income call? Sure. So I wouldn't rush into buying anything, you know, so, sort of blindly right now. I still think that we're going to have some pains over the next couple of weeks and months as inflation starts to stabilize. Really what we're looking for to get, you know, much more bullish in terms of buying fixed income is starting to see inflation stabilize and start to roll over. We're not there yet. We probably have through the summer a couple of more painful months. That said, I think that you can start looking at duration more attractively as you own against fixed across a you know a broader multi-asset perspective just given the fact that at least from a correlation perspective it's starting to be somewhat more negatively correlated to risk assets also when you look at IG bonds they're starting to look pretty attractive I still think that high yield just given some of the negative convexity and in, in those owning those assets still has probably more downside to go particularly in the riskier credits but particularly against IG bonds and some high quality duration 
duration bonds, you know, I start, you, I would start to, you know, dip my toe in now. So, Erin, just to get a sense of the timing and just the progression of how you see the opportunity arising, you would dip your toe in now, but remain in cash or remain in liquid fixed income and then wait for what before you become more fully invested in fixed income? I think owning a little bit of cash, a little bit of sort of shorter duration corporates and a little bit of duration makes sense, you know, as sort of very highly liquid instruments. And then as you start to see inf inflation really crest, that's the time when you're going to want to start to buy fixed income, you know, more holistically within your portfolio. You know, the one thing that I would say is that we're, we're you know, we've been in a market where duration's been selling off largely as a result of inflation, but we're coming to an, a point where each incremental basis point higher in inflation is really tipping the scales of the U.S. economy closer and closer into a recession, albeit likely a soft, you know, sort of recession or a shallow recession, but it is getting closer and closer. And so at this point, we're really quickly moving from late cycle, you know, into recessionary conditions. And that's where you want to start to increase fixed income within your portfolio. So when Tony Crescenzi and Jerome Schneider are going at it, there's got to be a tip point on inflation where you act. And PIMCO has been just incredibly accurate on this. Is that tip point off headline inflation or some custom core inflation index you have? So we do have a custom core inflation index, but right now what is impacting the consumer are necessities, and that's shelter, that's food, and that's inflation. Ultimately, that's what the pocketbook... You link those into your financial instruments. Yeah, I, I, you have to because you because that's ultimately what. Well, tell that to Jerome Powell. Does he? I don't think so. No, I mean I think <clears throat> you know, and I think that's why you may have the Fed tighten into a you know an early earlier than expected recession because ultimately that's what's hitting the pocketbooks uh, in terms of consumers right now, and that's what you know you've already started to see non necessities roll over in terms of inflation, but what inflation keeps taking higher on are those necessities, and that's ultimately what's going to you know create a, a shallow consumer recession. We're already I think in an Amazon on recession right now. We've already seen retail goods, um, durable goods spending start to roll over. And I think that that's, you know, an early canary in the coal mine for what's to come, you know, in the broader economy. Erin, awesome to hear from you as always. Erin Brown there of PIMCO already in what she called there, Tom, an Amazon recession for I, retail, for consumers. Well, that's right weird now. from Goldman Sachs as well. You know, I just look at girls who invest in. Can you imagine Erin Brown got the girls who invest sophomores all into that Austrian piece, that 100-year Austrian piece, and they're down like 70% like I am. Well, that was your I mean, investment advice. That was and, my investment and not advice. Aaron's back then at the time. Lorena Mester of the Cleveland Fed has just come out with some really interesting remarks, and we've written up the story, so allow me to bring you a paragraph of that. Fed research shows that it's more costly for policymakers to be wrong about inflation expectations being well anchored when they're not, uh, as opposed to erroneously assuming they are rising when they're actually... Uh, well anchored. That tells you something about where they see the balance of risks here, Tom, and why the likes of the Renamestra are looking to front load this effort. I mentioned this yesterday off of Jean Bovin, and Philip Hildenbrand was brilliant on this. This is going to be a huge debate. John, this really alludes to Jackson Hole going back to 2005 and Olivier yeah. uh, Blanchard and the confidence uh, that we have in stability of inflation. She is in Camp 75, Elisa, going into that July Fed meeting. A lot of people with her front-loading. Expect that to be the word of the day. Futures right now up a third of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100 up a quarter in around about 48 minutes. You will hear from Chairman Powell, President Lagarde, Governor Bailey, sitting around a table with Francine Lacroix of Bloomberg. Cannot wait for that. Looking forward to it. Full coverage right here on Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. NATO leaders are preparing to overhaul and boost the alliance's defenses in the face of Russian aggression in Europe. They want to establish a new force model that would put about 300,000 troops on high alert. President Biden says the U.S. will set up a permanent headquarters in Poland for the 5th Army Corps. NATO leaders are meeting in Madrid. The UK has imposed sanctions on Russia's richest person, Vladimir Paternin, as president of Norilsk Nickel, one of the world's largest producers of nickel, palladium and copper. According to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, he's worth more than $37 billion. 
And the pressure is building more on European Central Bank to raise interest rates for the first time in more than a decade. Inflation over in Spain has unexpectedly soared to a record 10%. That beat all estimates in a Bloomberg survey, and it dashed hopes that inflation in Spain had peaked. A former White House aide portrayed a violent and out of control Donald Trump in his presidency's final weeks. Cassidy Hutchinson gave the most gripping testimony yet in a House committee's hearings on the Capitol riot. The doubt has been cast on a key element of her second-hand account. Hutchinson says she was told the president tried to grab the steering wheel of his limousine after the Secret Service refused to drive him to the Capitol on January the 6th. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. This is a Volcker-esque type of Fed where they are clearly focused on getting inflation down and they are not going to throw away 40 years of credibility. They're not going to throw that credibility away just because, uh, um, you know, the markets are telling me. Greg Peters of PGM, he is not constructive on this equity market. Speaking on the Federal Reserve, we'll hear from the Fed Chair Jay Powell in about 40 minutes' time. Futures right now up a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up a quarter of 1% also. Downside surprise on German CPI relative to what we expected, let's say yesterday, once we got the regional breakdown of Germany this morning. It was largely expected. Euro dollar down about a tenth, 105.11. Yields in two basis points or so on a 10-year, 314.72. And just in the break there, I was working through that note, that speech, those remarks from Fed President Lorena Mester over mm -hmm. in central Portugal. It's really interesting stuff. This is a massive change at this Fed, and you can see them working through it in well, real time. Here's the quote, Tom. The current challenging situation in which a sequence of supply shocks have contributed to inflation being at 40-year highs calls into question the conventional view that monetary policy should always look through supply shocks. In some circumstances, such shocks could threaten the stability of inflation expectations and would require policy action. It's the world we've been in, Tom, in the last 18 months. She is the mathematician of the Fed. She's prodigious ability here at the dynamics that we're seeing now. I would say John Williams uh, joins her in that ability out of uh, Columbia and Barnard and uh, Princeton as, as well. But John, it speaks to the uncertainties as we go to this panel now in about 40 minutes. Kitschuk's to join us in a bit. John, do note Brent Crude out near 120. We're yeah, on our WTI way up. WTI 113, Tom, just creeping yeah. higher again. Greg Villiers with us on the elections, on what we learned in the, I guess this was, no, it's not the first Tuesday of June. We're late in June. But anyways, we had an election with some real results. Greg, I want to go to what the Democrats need to do to not focus inside the beltway and have a Democratic Party strategy across this nation. Kate Zerinke in the New York Times destroyed the Democrats this weekend, saying they've simply failed to go across the nation in organization. Yeah, you would think they'd be doing a lot better, Tom, on so many issues. I think that there is a need for something more unified. Maybe the abortion issue will finally get the party together. It's given them a a catalyst, but you and she and her piece are, are, are right. It, it's There's a lack of unity and strategy. A single sentence in your note this morning on the governor of California. What does good Mr. Newsom need to do? Well, I think he's running. He's starting to run some ads. I think he's making noise like he, he may run. You know, everybody's frozen in place right now because of Joe Biden. If, if Biden announces he's going to seek a second term, which I doubt, but if he does, that changes everything. If he doesn't, I think Newsom runs, and believe it or not, don't shoot the messenger here. I think Hillary Clinton may give thought to one last run. Wait, what? Say that one more time, Greg? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, right, I'm, I'm, I can't let that go. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. There's been a lot of speculation in the last few days that uh, if Biden doesn't run, 
and the Democrats don't have any clear favorite, that she might hop into the race. She's 74. That makes her, you know, fairly young by today's standards. But I, I do I don't rule out one last run by her if Biden doesn't run. Well, there's a lot to go on that particular line of questioning, Greg. But I do want to go back to uh, the task at hand for all legislators right now, which is trying to deal with inflation, which is the primary concern for a lot of investors, the social issues creeping up in terms of priorities for some voters. But is there any chance that this Congress could really take action in a material way from a legislative stance in terms of financing different kinds of programs or offsetting some of the inflationary pressures, <clears throat> given the lack of of unity and given the polarization that you were just talking about? Logically, you would think the answer would be yes, they will. But logic does not dominate Washington. And I think that while there's a lot of talk about tariffs, uh, a lot of talk about other programs that might help a little at the margin on inflation, I, I, I don't see it. I think, I frankly, I think Ukraine is more important. And as long as this war continues, the, we're going to have high energy prices, high food prices. I think that's the bigger factor. So, Greg, if that does spur some sort of recession, where is the fiscal impulse to respond? It, typically, doing the exact wrong thing at the exact wrong time, you're going to see Congress now get very frugal. Uh, not a lot of spending. Uh, Republicans will take the House. Uh, they're not. They don't want to spend a lot of money. So, just when you have monetary policy tightening, right. you're going to see fis fiscal policy tightening as well. Hey, Greg, frame it for me. A Sunday evening, the end of March, 1968. Lyndon Baines Johnson, overwhelmed by Vietnam, among others, said. I'm not going to run again. I was sitting on the couch. I remember it clear as a bell, a nation oh. stunned. What is Biden waiting for, or does he have to wait for March of 2024? Well, the, the, the March uh, that uh, you refer to with LBJ occurs on November 8th here in the U.S. That's the election. And if the House flips, which I still think is likely, Senate is a tougher call now because of abortion. But, you know, that could slip as well. I, I think that would be the catalyst to push Biden out. Okay. okay. It's not just his age. It's his polling numbers and the elections on November 8th. Greg, we've got to talk about the other ticket just briefly. That testimony yeah. yesterday. I want your view on this. Does that change you, the support yes. that the former president gets? And does that open the door a little bit wider for the governor from Florida? John, June of the year 2022 will be remembered as the month that pretty much finished off Donald Trump. It, it's it's not just that he may get indicted. Uh, it's not just that he has lost some altitude in the party. It's the mere fact that more and more of his own supporters are telling poll takers that one term's enough. We really are not excited about him running again. And that's his own supporters who are now starting to say that. That's the one to watch for sure. Greg, thank you. Greg Van Yer yeah, of AGF yeah. Investments. Music to the ears, I imagine, Tom, of a certain governor, Ron DeSantis, down in Florida. I read his biography the other day. I think the guy, it's somebody that we're learning. I mean, Don South, obviously, he's really known and he's known well within Republican circles. But he has an ex extraordinary biography. I, I, I was really quite taken uh, by the history, the path that he's taken. And then with all the notoriety in Florida, the polarization in Florida, I should say, John, uh, it, it's somebody that like I've got to get to know is how I'd put it. I, I agree. I think a lot of people have got to get to know him, Tom. Yeah. And that testimony yesterday, we're going to be talking about that for a long, long time. We'll be talking about a certain panel coming up in about 35 minutes time. A whole lot more on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Chairman Powell, President Lagarde, Governor Bailey, sitting down with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. Can't wait for this. Tom, I've said that repeatedly for the last 24 hours. It's 35 minutes away. Now, let's not forget Augustine Carstens. What there is is some intellectual firepower at this panel. I feel bad for Carstens. All from different <laughs> walks of life. Well, of course, Tom, we've sat down with frequently over the years, but yeah. ultimately it's about the other three on this occasion, isn't it? Yeah, I, I go with that, but it's what they don't say. Futures up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields in a single basis point on a 10-year, 315.66. Tom, laser ride, focused on crude, 113, almost 50 on WTI. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Futures are positive, about two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. We are 30 minutes away from hearing from Chairman Powell and President Lagarde alongside Governor Bailey. And I feel bad for Carson Augustus because he's there too and I haven't promoted him once all morning. But <laughs> and nobody Tom, else really Tom's knows he's there. filling in the gaps there. It's one of those awkward things where you feel like you have to ask the other person a few questions, but ultimately you know everyone wants to hear by, from just two of them. Absolutely. Powell and That's Lagarde. the way you are with me every um, day, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the way a lot of the audience are about this show, Tom. They just want to hear from Lisa. Oh, stop. The, the amount of hate mail that TK and I get about that. But anyway, that's another yeah, story. She gets all the love notes. Uh, all the time. All the time. It's not fair. Yeah, it's in two basis points on a 10-year. 314.90, Tom, on uh, 10. It's, fa you know, it's fascinating. I mean, Euro Swissy through parity is some real history. Even John, I, 119.50 on Brent with a $6 spread to West Texas Intermediate. And you look at Netherlands natural gas, John, which I really don't understand, other than Javier Blas says it's wicked important moving out to almost... Ukraine war highs. And don't want to be too selective with the stories. I think it's important to yeah, the agree. other side of things too, yeah. because yesterday we talked about China coming back online <clears> off the back of cutting a quarantine period, not getting rid of it, but easing it yeah. for travellers. She came out and basically just said, herd immunity, no thank you. Let's stick to COVID zero. That, that was a pretty strong statement from Xi, according to Xinhua News. Our country has a large population. Such strategies as herd immunity and lying flat would lead to consequences right. that are unimaginable. <clears throat> That's President Xi. So if you're thinking about their stepping away from COVID zero anytime soon, well, the, the leader of the Communist Party in China right. clearly has other ideas. John Burns Murdoch at FT making very clear, John, there's been a little bit of a tick up in the, um, uh, the, the, the variants, whatever they call them, and the virus, and a little bit of a tick up in the statistics here. Not concern, but nevertheless something uh, to watch for. Here what we're going to do. We welcome all of you on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tommy. John, are you going to stay with us till nine today? You've got me I for believe the so. Full hour. This special hour, coverage hour. here. So special. Twenty-eight minutes away here from really the conversation of the year in central banking. Francine Lacroix with leading central bankers. We start strong this half hour with Jay Bryson, chief economist at Wells Fargo, with international finance work at the Federal Reserve, I should say, as well. Jay, I want to take the other side of the gloom that's out there, something David Rosenberg's talked about and the wonderful John Sylvia's talked about with his sense of history as well. There can be high inflation, and then suddenly there's not. To go back to World War II and 20% inflation of 1947 and on down to the Eisenhower disinflation, is there disinflation out there, Jay, that we just don't see right now? Well, uh, you know, I th so uh, disinflation, I think disinflation is coming next year um, as the economy slows because of the central bank rate hikes around the world. The question is, where do you settle out in terms of the inflation yeah. rate? Now, are we going back to 2%? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, so what if we settle out at 3% here in the United States? Is the Fed happy with that, or do they think they have to get us back to two? That'll be the interesting, you know, sort of question going forward. Olivia Blanchard and, Jay, and, and Adam Posen, particularly uh, Dr. Posen, have really advanced this idea of 3% is the new level. You remember what Olivier did at the IMF right off the crisis there of modeling even 4%, and he was taken out to the economic cleaners for even mentioning 4% is a viable goal. What do we do, Dr. Bryson, when we get back to 4% inflation? Well, you know, Tom, I think maybe what we're going to be looking at going forward is what the Fed did in the 90s and the first part of, of the century here. And that was, they called it opportunistic disinflation. You know, so if you, if you go back to the 90s, right, the, the inflation rate throughout the 90s was like 3.5%. That sounds high relative to where we were in the last 20 years. But, you know, the economy performed pretty well. And, and what the Fed decided to do during that period of time is not put the economy through a ringer. You know, they called it opportunistic when, when, when um, recessions came along and the inflation rate came down, that reset expectations, and they went from there. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we settle out at 3 3.5%, the Fed says, okay, victory, 
um, we're done and we're going to wait to the next recession to bring it back down to two and a half or two or, or something like that. Jay, that was the consensus last week. And it seems like we're getting an increasing amount of angst around that uh, consensus, that ability for the Fed to step away once there is the right trajectory of inflation and wait and be patient. I want to go back to that Loretta Mester quote that John was talking about, Cleveland Fed president, where she was saying that essentially the Fed research hints at a greater risk of not going hard enough with respect to rate hikes and allowing longer term inflation expectations to become unmoored than the opposite. In other words, it's actually more of a risk to not be hawkish enough. And that is why she believes in perhaps a 75 basis point at next month's meeting. How much is this the new idea at the Fed that they need to be more aggressive or fear a repeat of the 1970s? Well, so, you know, I think um, it's interesting to see what the consensus at the Fed will be. I mean, obviously, uh, President Mester is a little bit on the more hawkish side of things. I think she would, you know, be very close to where Bullard is right now as well. But there's other members of the FOMC who don't take such a hawkish sort of view. You know, what, what is John Williams thinking right now? What is Chairman Powell thinking right now? And so, uh, it, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this whole thing play, you know, plays out. And, you know, again, I don't think we're talking the difference between, say, 12 percent and 2 percent. Well, you know, we're talking about, hopefully, the difference between two and, let's say, four. OK, and reasonable minds, I think, can differ in there. But, you know, Lisa, back to your point, if inflation expectations, if, if suddenly we're, we're looking at what people are thinking is inflation is going to be 7 percent over the next five to 10 years, that's a whole bit different story. And if you just look at the most recent um, University of Michigan long term surveys, uh, five to 10 year survey. I mean, that's still around 3%, maybe a little bit north. So I wouldn't say that inflation expectations have got completely unmoored at this point. Yet. Jay, you've got a recession call for next year, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. We think, we think we're looking at a mild recession starting sometime mid 2023. Can you talk to me about the character of that recession? You use that word mild. I hear that a lot. What brings you to that conclusion, Jay? What is it about where we are in this economy that means the downturn, if we do get one, isn't going to be severe? So if you look at the underlying fundamentals of the economy right now, let's start with consumer balance sheets. You know, consumer balance sheets are actually in pretty good shape right now um, you know, across the board. Uh, the household sector is not levered up. As a matter of fact, the debt to GD, uh, the debt to income ratio of the household sector is back before low, lower than what it was before the housing bubble started to inflate. Business balance sheets in general are, are also pretty good right now. The, pro, you know, the, the banking system is very, very well capitalized. So, I mean, we, we, I don't think we're looking at a 2006 sort of scenario where the system was just completely levered up. The banking system was not very well capitalized. And so the, the economy should be able to withstand all these other sorts of stresses. <clears throat> that said, you know, there may be things out there right now that none of us really know about. And the problem with recessions is the stresses from that. It, it tends to, if there's cracks, underlying cracks in the foundation, they tend to really to widen. We just don't know what those cracks are yet. Jay, uh, the counter argument to this is Rob not of Research Affiliates coming out in an interview with Bloomberg saying the simple fact is recessions are usually created. They don't happen naturally. Economic expansions don't die of old age. They're murdered by the Fed. And we're seeing that happen again now, that the Fed is going to have to go so aggressively that it will kill the economic cycle. And there could be a lot of downside because of how much the Fed has done in terms of easing for the past decade. What's your counter argument to that? So my, my counter argument to that would be so if you're if you're looking at so did the Fed kill um, the reset the, the expansion in the very, very early 1980s by, you know, the monitor experiment at the Fed. Yes, the real Fed funds rate at that point in time, you know, it, it went up into high single digits. Interest rates were extremely high at that at that point. I don't think we're looking at the Fed raising rates into double digit sort of territory here. And so I, I don't I, you know, what, what we're looking at is, you know, a recession. Right. But I would say it's benchmarked to the 1990, 91 recession. Peak to trough decline back there was one and a half percent. Peak to trough decline in the early 1980s was two and a half percent. And then the great what we used to call the Great Recession, the financial crisis, that was like four percent. I don't think we're looking at those sorts of things. I think, again, it's more of a 1990, early 1990s sort of downturn that we're looking at. Jay Bryson, thank you, Jay, of Wells Fargo. Looking forward, 
not precisely looking forward, but looking ahead, I guess, to potentially yeah. a recession yeah. next year. Forgive my choice of words. Bed, Bath & Beyond, the recession's here, isn't it? I think it was Aaron Brown about 30 minutes ago said the recession here is Amazon. The Amazon recession is here already. Bed, Bath & Beyond is down 15%. Do you want a quarter-to-date guide from Bed, Bath & Beyond? Comp sales in the down 20% range. Lisa, some of these numbers coming out of these retailers are just absolutely remarkable. And we've talked about this now for a number of weeks, whether it was Target, Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, really take your pick. Why are we surprised by any of this? And when we talk about the retailers and the difficulties they're having or will have, I get a ton of pushback about this, Lisa, quite often. People say, well, that's obvious, I know. Why aren't the earnings down already? Right. Why aren't we forecasting some of this? And then you see these moves in the stock market and... Clearly, it's not well-priced at all. I think it's very difficult to get your head around what the challenge is for retailers. It's not just supply chain disruptions anymore. It's not even inflationary pressures, which are well understood in some areas of the market. It has to oh. do with changing appetites of, of just consumers, right? They're buying different things. And how much do you deal with inventories that you pre-ordered that suddenly are coming in that nobody wants? John, I've never seen this before. At NATO, with Maria Tadeo and Anne-Marie Horton, there is a meeting of the President of the United States and the leadership of non-NATO members, Japan and South Korea, Secretary Blinken and Austin in attendance as well. John, this is just, all the rules are getting broken. This is on China. And while NATO is a group of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is going to adapt. Once a watch for the rest of today. Futures down a tenth of 1%. You will be hearing from Chairman Powell, President Lagarde and Governor Bailey in around about 19 minutes' time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says central bankers should act forcefully to curb rising price pressures. In remarks prepared for the ECB forum in Portugal, Mester said central banks should not be complacent about increases in long-term inflation expectations. Mester told CNBC earlier that the Fed is just at the beginning of raising interest rates. Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will meet with President Biden to push for the purchase of new F-16 warplanes. The two will talk during the NATO summit over in Madrid. Erdogan is now seeking to capitalize on a relatively positive atmosphere in relations with NATO and the U.S. Ties had grown cold after Turkey bought advanced Russian air defense systems. And the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has declined the January 6th committee's request for her to testify. A lawyer for Virginia Thomas says there is no sufficient basis for her to appear before the panel. Emails have indicated that her efforts to prevent Joe Biden from taking office were more extensive than previously known. Shares of Carnival slumped after Morgan Stanley warned the cruise line could lose all its value in the event of another demand shock. Carnival and peers like Royal Caribbean saw their revenue plummet during the pandemic. Shares were down roughly 50% for the year. The European Union is effectively heralding the end of an era of internal combustion engines. EU members have endorsed a push to eliminate carbon emissions from new cars by 2035. Environment ministers struck a deal after Italy, the home of Ferrari and Lamborghini supercars, gave up demands for a five-year delay. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're not at peak year, peak yield there. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, front end of the curve continuing to, uh, to be under pressure to go up um, and recession risks continue to build up. Um, so I think that's the story for the next few months until we see a bigger pivot for central banks, which we think will come, but it's going to be after some pain has been done. Jean Bavan there, the head of BlackRock Investment Institute. What's about to happen in 10, 11, 12 minutes time, the panel of the year, all the ingredients 
for the most interesting panel of central bankers you will see in 2022 and maybe, Tom, through the next several years. Coming up very shortly, you'll hear from Chairman Powell, <coughs> President Lagarde and Governor Bailey sitting down with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua. TK, this is a yeah. big conversation coming up. Jackson Hole is going to have a tough act to follow here, John. You've highlighted it this week, a three-day panel, I believe it was. Lagarde sizzling Loretta Mester sizzling, and on we go to this panel. They've got some work to do, Tom. Just how much well, and how much pain will they inflict on this economy as they try and bring inflation back down? The times we live in, and particularly with a war uh, in Ukraine, is evidenced by President Biden meeting with the leadership of Japan and South Korea as we speak in Madrid at NATO. Kriti Gupta here with a chart this morning. Kriti, what do you have? Yeah, Tom, ahead of that central bank panel, which John just mentioned, the key question is how much work do they have to do? How hawkish, for example, does the Federal Reserve have to go? Which brings me to my chart of the day, or perhaps a gauge to figure out just how hawkish they can go. So look at that two-year tips yield. Something that Chairman Powell brought up in the last press conference was simply looking at real rates. They're negative for most of the yield curve, unless you look at the front end of the curve. And this is significant because as we ask, once again, how much more hawkish can you go? Check this out. This is a, a, a part of the market that is still in negative territory. And since 1990, the Fed has never ended a tightening cycle while real rates were in negative territory. So the, mm -hmm. simply the fact that this is still so far low suggests that there is quite a bit of work to do. Uh, Kriti Gupta, thank you so much as well. We are honored that Kit Jukes could join us now, Chief Foreign Exchange Strategist at Society General, with truly decades of experience on central banking. Kit you simply, what will you listen for on this panel? I'm expecting to hear a lot of resolute comments about making sure they get the job done. Uh, a lot of talk about inflation expectations needing to be get to get under control, uh, and to, that, that effectively that fighting inflation and winning this battle is the single most important thing facing central banks with everything else that's going on. So I'm expecting to come out of this more convinced rather than less convinced that they're going to end up over tightening because they have no choice to do anything else, anything, anything other than that. Things, that, that that's what I'm waiting yeah, for. Things are very fluid right now, including a resurrection of divine confidence from a 2005 paper of Olivier Blanchard. But the new kid on the block, maybe it's front loading, but maybe more kid jokes, it's Christine Lagarde dealing with the polarities of Europe. You live this with your five or six residences in the Iberian Peninsula. Tell us how you treat the fragmentation that she does not want to speak about at this panel. Oh, I think she's trying. I mean, they're, they're trying to come up with a plan that they can sell credibly to, to fight fragmentation. It's clearly going to involve sterilizing some bond purchase. You, you, you have to play a confidence game to stop people wanting to sell bonds, to stop people wanting to start people wanting to get the additional yield on them. The, the challenge that they face, firstly, is that yields in, in Italian debt and so on rose because U.S. Treasury yields rose. So uh, they're on the wrong side of the Atlantic to solve the fundamental issue. Uh, on their side, they've said they want to stop buying bonds and then raise rates. But I don't think you can stabilize the bond market without buying bonds. So you need to sterilize the purchase, come up with a bit of slate of hand, the kind of magic that the European Central Bank's been trying for, for a long time, uh, in the hope that that does the trick and restores confidence. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it, how confident they are about how fast they can restore that confidence. But that's the that's the line they're going to try to tread. We've, we've seen this before. Kit, I don't want to be overly disparaging about the individuals on that stage that will speak in about nine minutes, but at the crossroads of a pretty difficult moment for the economy and economic history, what do you make of it that we're being led by a couple of the lawyers? Um, I, I, I don't think the people running committees need to be the world's greatest economists. They just need to listen to some great economists. Um, and equally, some great economists say some pretty foolish things because we, you know, they, they get stuck that, like we all do in, in their kind of perceived vision of how the world works. I, I do just think that having, having seen so many events come together, which gave us so much inflation so quickly, it's impossible not to conclude that you have to hit inflation with a big hammer to get it back down because you can't afford to get it wrong. And, and so irrespective of the, of the individuals, and you know, we could, we, we could put Larry Summers in charge of the whole thing and we'd get the same outcome. A big hammer, probably <laughs> a significant slowdown after some big rate hikes and then pick up the pieces. And in 10 years time, we'd ask, as we do of Paul Volcker now, did he really need to go so hard?
That's exactly what Lorena Mester is addressing today. She thinks the bigger mistake is going, not going hard enough than going too hard in a paper over in Sintra, Portugal. I'd like your point, your view, Kit, on the differences between, say, Europe and the ECB effort, the UK and the Bank of England effort, and the US and the Federal Reserve effort. I think we've sort of poised this, teed this up as some big conference where the three of them face the same issue. How different is it, the UK versus Europe versus the US, as they try and tackle this problem? Always chalk and cheese, but the biggest difference in Europe is that there's a war going on in Ukraine and Europe is hostage to or certainly dependent on natural gas supplies from Russia. And so European natural gas consumers, which includes industry, uh, are paying a far higher price than that, uh, already than is being seen in the United States. That's a particularly European piece that means, uh, you know, that there's the danger, the biggest danger for Europe is a recession that comes from that reliance on, on Russian natural gas. Uh, the UK has already got much tighter fiscal policy, an economy that's losing momentum, uh, a whole, you know, more labour market shortages than the rest of Europe. Uh, and so I think the UK is done, really, in the sense that, um, you know, we'll go on seeing higher rates here, but the economy's losing momentum very quickly here. I think the, the thing where everyone has, what everyone has in common is that households are seeing their real income growth turn sharply negative all at the same time, at the same time as everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. We told the kids they could have a holiday in the sunshine. We booked, F we booked planes and we all want to consume services instead of goods at the same time. And by the end of the summer, we'll have a lot less money left than we had at the beginning. That's a universal across Europe, uh, perhaps particularly in places that can't get to the beach by car, train or yeah. some means other than an airport. Kit, I feel like you're talking directly to me as I look at some of the uh, vacation plans we have lined up. There is this issue when you talk about paying for all of this, the currency transmission, and it brings us back to your world, the very heart of which perhaps is the policy differentials and the different kinds of economic backdrops that John was talking about. What is going to be the main driver here in terms of the differentials? Is it going to be the rate hiking cycle and how quickly different central banks can catch up to one another? Or is it going to be the economic outlook and the disproportionate impact from, say, a 50 basis point rate hike at the ECB on long-term uh, growth expectations versus a 75 basis point hike in the United States? Um, I think it's a combination. I mean, the, the BIS annual economic report that came out was it yesterday or the day before um, uh, really highlighted how everything is being moved by interest rates at the moment. So it's this Fed hiking that's really set the stage for everything. Um, in, in my world, the first thing about that is the UK was first to raise rates, the US followed, and the Europeans are coming up last. Normally, in that sense, we'd get what we got, which was the dollar's strong earlier, uh, sterling is strong even before the dollar, and then the euro will go on strengthening for longer. That's where, that's where the situation in Ukraine messes up everything, because I don't know how you buy the euro with that, uh, with that elephant in the room with, with us. Um, I do think that coming out on the other side of a slowdown what kind of economic recovery we expect in different countries will become important. That it, it, has to be, it has to be something sustainable. But, I mean, in a sense, that'll be a nice problem. At the moment, we're just trying to, you know, engineer soft landings rather than face hard landings, uh, you know, as, as, as central banks tackle these multiple, uh, these multiple shocks all at the same time. I think going in, everybody gets dragged in. In the same way as, as in previous crises, it doesn't matter where the where the global recession started, um, if if we get a hard landing, we're all going to feel it. So so the bigger question right now is, do we don't we get a hard landing? And until we know, the dollar stays bid. All right. So, kid, given that, just last question to you: Do you have a sense that the dollar is peaking? That there really has been some sort of peak, at least in the near term, in terms of the range? No, I think uh, I, look, the, the dollar is say it, it peaks earliest when we have a really soft landing and we start pivoting from investing in the dollar to places where they're going to be raising rates, where they're going to be normalizing, where yields are more attractive. I just don't think that that's something we can do safely this side of September at the absolute earliest. I think what we're going to get is a period of volatility where we have to answer one question before we answer the question about the dollar, which is, um, have 10-year notes even peaked in yield yet? And, and I think that if they have, they're going to be extremely bumpy because the Fed certainly hasn't peaked yet uh, and probably hasn't peaked for several more months. So uh, I, I think the dollar's almost certainly got another high in it. 
Uh, but right. if it doesn't have one, it's going to be awfully messy. Kitchus, please stay with us from Society Generale. Jen Farrell, uh, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. A special hour here of Bloomberg Surveillance this morning. John, in preparation for, without question, the panel of the year. And I like what Augusta Karstens and the BIS said off of the Jukes report from Geneva, and that is there is no respite for the global economy. Keep saying it. They've got some work to do. Mike McKee's with us as well. Mike, looking forward to this. Kit Jukes alongside us. Walk me through what you're looking for from this panel that's set to begin in the next couple of minutes. Well, the obvious question, John, uh, flows from what Kit, Kit was saying. How far do they have to go and how fast? But I'm not sure anybody has a good answer. Uh, speaking with Fed officials uh, in recent weeks, they kind of focus on the idea that we don't know what's going to happen going forward. A lot of what's in inflation now comes from external shocks that we could still face. So while we know we need to raise rates a lot, why do it all at once. I mean, there is an argument to be made for ripping off the Band-Aid, but just in case you're wrong, you can just do these big rate hikes going forward. Now, some of them may make that point. I think the other point that will come out of this is that uh, the inflation problem is different in each of these three central banks, for each of these three central banks. In the U.S., it's COVID and the war and energy prices and also uh, external stimulus from the fiscal side. Uh, the Brits have uh, energy prices and Brexit. And much of what's going on in Europe is, of course, from the war in Ukraine and energy prices. So they each have to approach it a little bit differently. TK, I think that's the big point here going into this, that we've set this up as they're all tackling the same problem. And to some degree, they are. But there are some differences here, TK. From country to country, economy to economy. Yeah, I, I'm going to, you know, we can go all day on this, but Michael McKee, I'm going to go on this with Brent crude near 120, 119.88 now, up a dollar 90. We've had a real run on oil here. Obviously, for all of these panelists, through 120 on Brent crude is their worst outcome. But for Europe, it is the crucible of their problem right now. Javier Blas, wonderful on European natural gas. We don't, I mean, Jerome Powell doesn't have the hydrocarbon headache that Christine Lagarde has, does she? Well, not in the same sense. The Fed still has an issue with the fact that gasoline prices are very high, and that's what Americans think of as inflation. I was talking to some people about the uh, Michigan survey and the New York Fed survey yesterday and how they show a little bit of movement upward in long-term inflation expectations, but Americans have yeah. no idea what the inflation rate is. They just know what the price of gasoline is. So the Fed has the problem of headlines uh, causing uh, problems with expectations. And the real issue for the ECB beyond that is going to be this fall when we get into natural gas. Uh, the yeah. United States has plenty of supply, yeah. but Europe doesn't. Kitschuks, how will this be expressed through foreign exchange? We note Euro Swiss through parity today, strong Swiss franc. I think the one surprise kit we can say besides the rebuilding at Arsenal has been the Swiss National Bank and what they've done over the last 10 days or so. How is this expressed through foreign exchange, the challenges of these bankers? I, I think the foreign exchange market still errs towards safe havens or towards central bankers, whether in a sense they're reliable. You know, the Swiss National Bank surprised everybody by being hawkish. The Swiss, the Swiss have a low inflation and a rate and a super strong currency because they're consistently hawkish when they can be. Uh, they saw an opportunity to start moving back to, towards and above zero rates uh, over time and grabbed it with two arms and sacrificed the idea of keeping the currency down in the process. And maybe they'll come in and intervene aggressively to try to sort of limit the pain on that front. But, um, but that, that tells you, you know, in a sense, that tells you that the euro is already a good bit lower than it would have been were it not for the geopolitics. So, so the euro is held back by, you know, the fact that it's got a central bank that wants to fight inflation, but they also have to fight fragmentation, and they can't do anything about uh, natural gas supplies in the short run. So that they're more hampered. Um, the dollar, I think, is different in the sense that it is just the world's safe haven currency at this point in time. When you have a hawkish Fed, you get... Uh, you get a strong dollar, you know, until it stops being hawkish. So I think that's that's just more, you know, there's less differentiation in that sense. And I think that's why the dollar is the go-to currencies at times like this. And it's why when Paul Volcker was hiking rates so aggressively back in the, in, in 19, in the 1980s, um, the dollar went so much higher than it is now by any kind of comparison. Um, and so the danger is if the Fed really does feel the need to go hard, go big, 
that, that we're going to get quite a lot more dollar strength before we're done. Mike, as we wait here for this panel, how much can these central bankers get ahead of the story when the story is so uncertain? Mike. <laughs> that is an issue for them because, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Americans don't know what the inflation rate is, but they know what gasoline prices are. And the Fed can't do anything about gasoline prices. So it is hard for them to control the narrative, especially when you have a president saying inflation is the Fed's problem. So they, they are going to have to work on their communications, and it is difficult for them. I think the ECB, in that sense, has a little bit easier job because everybody can look to energy uh, and the war as, as a problem. But as Kit noted, they also have the the fragmentation problem. So their communications are going to be about why we have to stimulate some economies at the same time we are uh, tightening <clears> on some <throat> economies. And, and that's a, a tough story to tell. If you're just tuning in on TV and radio, we're just waiting for a start of a panel between Chairman Powell, President Lagarde and Governor Bailey in Central Portugal. TK, they've just played this opening video. We've got someone making some introductory remarks. Then Francine's going to take over. And once Francine takes over, we'll bring you that panel. But TK, I believe that one is about a couple mm. of seconds away now. You with always the rudest questions. John, what's your question to Governor Bailey? Why did they get it so wrong? And I think that's for all three of them. And some of them, Tom, have done a better job than others at about explaining it. But they got it very, very wrong. Let's be clear about that. And I think you've got to start with some pretty hard questions up front. I think the, the, the other idea, and this again looking forward, is how you come down with an assumed disinflation, and you may get an assumed disinflation, but as Jay Bryson and, and others said, I thought Aaron Brown was great on it. I mean, you get down to what, and then what? And are we really setting ourselves up for a new, uh, a, a new higher inflation rate? A special thanks to Kit Jukes and Mike McKee. I believe we can now cross over to Francine and listen in to a must-watch panel. For almost 15 years of policy experimentation in an age really defined by stubbornly low inflation. Now, this year that has changed. As Claire was saying, our policy panel needs a little introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Jerome Powell is the chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England. Augustin Carstens uh, governed the Bank of Mexico before becoming general manager of the Bank for International Settlements. And, of course, our host, the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde. Now, just a reminder, between them, these institutions hold nearly 20 trillion dollars worth of assets on their balance sheet. And they've, of course, maintained ultra low, even negative interest rates for the better part of a decade with little disruption. They now have the unenviable position of presiding over the great unwinding of policy that may have permanently changed the architecture of global markets. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to have, I'm sure, a robust discussion over the next 90 minutes. Um, Mr. Carsons, let me start with you as a central bank of central banks. You know, central banks in general have faced really a succession of crises over the past years, but also some of the structural factors, such as the green transition, digitalization and increased onshoring. So how different will the future of inflation be from now on? How different will it be from the last decade? Well, I mean, a very, a very important change that has taken place uh, in the last, I would say, two decades, or even more, if, for example, if we compare this period of inflation with the 70s, is that we have much stronger institutional Frame, monetary frameworks and institutional framework for central banks. And I think they are far better positioned to combat inflation. If we go back to 70s, and 70s have become a natural reference, uh, we were at the time where, for example, in the Bretton Woods it, it, it was, was failing. Uh, you don't have more, uh, I would say, instability in a system when you are, for example, revising...